Majority Report with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report. With Sam Cedar. <laughs> and I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Monday, December 7th, 2020. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five time award winning majority report. We are broadcasting live steps and steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Washington Bureau Chief of the Intercept, Ryan Grimm. On the politics of Biden's personnel. Meanwhile, Biden wins again. (laughs) President almost for the third time as Georgia recertifies its results. Meanwhile, California Attorney General and Medicare for All supporter Javier Becerra picked to lead Biden's Health and Human Services Department. A vote on an anemic second COVID relief bill seems likely this week. U.S. sets another record day for COVID infections. And folks, it's going to get worse. Shutdowns in California. Coming soon, maybe, uh, to your town. The Education Department extends the freeze on payments and interest on student loans to the end of January 2021. Rudy Giuliani tests positive for the coronavirus, leaves chaos in his wake in a rush to assess whom he infected. Argentina passes a millionaire tax to deal with their COVID crisis. Talks break down and protests by tens of thousands of Indian farmers continue. And the second least effective coup attempt of 2020 winds down as Juan Guaido's shadow administration sees high profile exits. All this and more on today's Majority Report. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for joining us on a Monday here with Emma Vigland. Hello, Emma. Hello, Sam. How are you today? I am doing okay. It is a another Monday and, of course, another win for Joe Biden in Georgia. I don't know if the state of Georgia has ever been won so many times in one single election. It's um, rather uh, impressive. We will, of course, be uh, covering the... Um, the rally, or really not that much, we're going to cover the rally in Georgia uh, by Donald Trump. It was um, interesting only insofar as there seemed to be a lot of out-of-town folks who attended the rally for Trump in Georgia, and they seemed to be people who were far more interested in rallying against the election officials in Georgia than promoting the candidacy of the two sitting senators in Georgia who are facing a runoff election uh, less than a month from now. Well, that was Trump's agenda as well. (laughs) Yeah, and that was clearly Trump's agenda as well. I mean, he did sort of like... (laughs) Lip service. I don't really care. I mean, he literally openly said, I don't want to do these rallies anymore. I'm sick of it. (laughs) It was He uh, wants to do full-on just about him rallies. Right. No more of these rallies for other people. Um, and uh, we will also uh, uh, talk about the the debate that um, Kelly Leffler and Raphael Warnock had. Uh, there is not going to be a debate for the other race, John Ossoff versus David Perdue, because Perdue was afraid to. Um, he was called out by Ossoff in the last debate or the first debate, the first and last debate they had in the run up to the general election for being a bit of a crook. And since that time, there have been even more reports about 
his stock trading relative to how much information or what information he got as a sitting senator. Um, so w- we will not have that debate to happen. And, and uh, the debate, it's hard to know how much these debates at this point are really going to uh, influence voters in Georgia. It is very much about turnout and it's very much about the bases. So uh, we will get to that. Uh, and before we get to any more um, we're going to take a quick break for our sponsors, and um, then we'll be back with Ryan Grimm. Folks, uh, for many of us, the holidays are going to look really different this year, particularly as we get more and more news about this, no doubt. And um, we're not going to have family and friend reunions, likely, shouldn't, probably, uh, for health. But that shouldn't stop you uh, from feeling close. You can give your loved ones one of the most meaningful gifts that you can give them this year. And it's not just a gift for them. It's a gift for you. StoryWorth is an online service. And what it does is it helps your loved ones share stories from their lives um, through sending them thought-provoking questions, questions you wouldn't think of, questions that seem sort of banal sometimes, but get the, uh, the juices flowing. So what happens every week, StoryWorth emails your family uh, member or I guess you could do it for friends too. Um, and what happens is the your family member writes out a response to the question, which begins to build their sort of their life stories. Um, you can read the weekly stories. And after a year, and this is what's really special, the story worth will compile all of the stories, including pictures that you uh, submit into a, a beautiful keepsake book that you can give as a gift or you can order multiple copies, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is a, um, a wonderful gift for, I mean, obviously for, for, for you to give to your parents, for you to give to your, uh, your grandparents. Um, it creates a living record of these folks and, you know, t- uh, take it from me. You don't necessarily have these folks uh, around and, um, uh, able to sort of, you know, fill in the blanks. It's a great gift that you're ostensibly giving to them, but you're giving to yourself and giving to your kids. Um, really uh, great idea too. And, you know, the questions are not hard questions. They're, they're, they're simple questions. Like, I, I don't know, like what was the, your first car or, or who did you go to the prom with or something like that. Um, and it, it just gets people thinking and they'll tell you stories that, you, that are maybe a little bit off topic, but that's sort of, Part of the point, uh, you give your loved ones the gift of spending time together wherever you live with StoryWorth. Get started right away. No shipping required by going to storyworth.com slash majority. You'll get $10 off your first purchase. That's storyworth.com slash majority for $10 off. Oh, um, and this one uh, is a product that we have used on this show as well. Um, for a lot of us, our home, not just our home, ends up being our, uh, our, our workplace as well. Um, for instance, your podcast studio, maybe. Maybe you're, do, you're doing it from remote. You got the um, little bit of yellow on this uh, version. I don't know if people pick that out. Sometimes Emma and I are in studio together. Sometimes we're not. This is a week where we're not. And um, this is a week where we're not, but I, still... I look so much better for that very reason. What's that? <laughs> Look at that. Look at that. Yes, your background looks a little better. But oh, come on. Here's the bottom line uh, if you're a business owner or a people manager, home is probably also where you're going to have to do your hiring. That's where ZipRecruiter comes in. We've talked about ZipRecruiter for years now. And um, you know that ZipRecruiter makes hiring easier, it makes it faster. It is all in one convenient place online, allows you to organize uh, what you're doing. They have matching technology that goes out and finds applicants for you, as well as you inviting applicants in. If you are really interested in a candidate, you can invite them uh, to apply for your job that you see them uh, amongst the ZipRecruiter sort of database. With one click, ZipRecruiter sends them an email from you and you stand out from the competition. It is no wonder that four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. I am one of those people. Did you know this, uh, Emma? This is how we got Brendan on the show. 
I did. I did. I know because you always talk about how awesome it is that Brendan's on the show and ZipRecruiter is what brought us to that's, that's him what, to that's us. That's the only thing I talk about when I that's didn't all. mention Brendan to anybody. It's always <laughs> just that he came through ZipRecruiter. Um, and it was great. We had many, many, many uh, great candidates. Uh, it's just uh, Brendan uh, nailed it. Right now, you can try ZipRecruiter for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash majority. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash majority. All you need is Wi-Fi to try it for free. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash majority. ZipRecruiter, it is the smartest way to hire and uh, the, the, the most organized way in this, um, in this era, if you will. Meanwhile, also, you're at home. Online shopping can be a little bit daunting. You don't know if things are going to fit. You don't know. uh, Sometimes returns can be a pain. You don't know what store to start with. And if you're like me, you have no idea what kind of clothes you should get at any given point. Stitch Fix has fixed that for me. It offers clothing that's hand-selected by expert stylists based upon your size, your style, and your budget. And even if you don't know that you have a style, like, for instance, I have no idea uh, that I had a style. Um, I'm, it's, I still don't think it's anything to brag about. But uh, what you do is you get your own personal stylist. And the, the site asks you all sorts of questions about what kind of clothes you like and wear. And you get different things. And you, I, sometimes I'll go on there and you can just, I'll kill some time by just saying, I don't like that. I do like that. I do like this. I don't like that. And what it does is it get basically builds an understanding of what kind of things that you like. And they set up a, what they call a, uh, a fix for you, which is a, basically a, a box. You pay a $20 styling fee for each box, which gets credited toward any of the pieces that you keep. There's no subscri- subscription required. You try it once. You could do one-offs or you can set up automatic deliveries. Shipping, returns, exchanges, they're easy and they're free. They send a prepaid return envelope is included in every box. It has styles and clothing for men, for women, for kids. They ship all over the U.S. and they're available in the U.K. too. For me, and this is what I found interesting, there was only one thing I returned in my first bo- uh, box. That was a mock turtleneck. But I kept my uh, five pair of uh, pocket pants, started wearing that cut of uh, pants again. I kept my, um, my chukas or chukas or whatever. I can't remember how you pronounce them, but Brendan always corrects me. There was a flannel crew that I kept for me that Mila absconded with. Uh, <laughs> but as long as one of us is getting use out of it. And they sent me, and this was back in, in gosh, this was back in, I, I get this one thing in, in February. It was a thermal, it's a Pilsen thermal crew, which I thought like, I'm not sure about this, but I kept it. And now I wear it far too often without, <laughs> sometimes I'll wear it days in a row. I mean, it's, it's like it, the, the first piece of clothing comfort, off, uh, my, off the laundry pile. I have yes, those. Yeah. It's my comfort uh, shirt. Yeah. You can get started today at stitchfix.com slash majority. You get 25% off when you keep everything in your fix. That's stitchfix.com slash majority. 25% off when you keep everything in your fix. Stitchfix.com slash majority. All right, let's uh, welcome uh, to the show. Uh, Ryan's not quite here yet. We don't have uh, Ryan quite yet? Okay, well, um, let's uh, listen to uh, Donald Trump at the MAGA rally in Georgia. Um, This was on Saturday. You know, there's a lot of people who have made the point that, like, this would be uh, far more disturbing if... It wasn't so sort of late in the game and so clear that Donald Trump had lost the election in about four different ways. Um, But here he is basically articulating what has been the sine qua non, if you will, of the conservative movement. (laughs) I appreciate that. It is this sense of aggrievement and you know it can come from any different type of place your 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 world is being undermined because of marriage equality um you're under threat from a caravan that is a, a thousand miles away um you're not allowed to be uh, sexist or racist in the office anymore um 
All of this sense of aggrievement is what drives uh, conser the conservative movement. And here is Donald Trump making it even more explicit in Georgia. This is clip number one. So don't listen to my friends. Just go out. Just go out. And you know what they're saying? They're saying, we want you to fix the system. We're going to fix the system. But the system will be fixed when these people get in. They'll get in and we'll fix the system. Because we're all, we're all victims. Everybody here, all these thousands of people here tonight, they're all victims, every one of you. All victims. Well, that's exactly what they project onto the left and are always saying that the left uh, is is constantly crying uh, foul when they say something offensive, that the left is full of snowflakes. Ben Shapiro's calling card is, is uh, facts over feelings. But there's nothing more in your feelings than just perpetual victimhood. And Trump just said it out loud there. Um. It it's impressive now. And the, and the real question is, is like, and, and then I think that like, you know, we've been reading for quite a bit is, will this motivate people to come out and vote? I mean, in general, the idea that you are aggrieved because, you know, political correctness or because, you know, wokeness is imposing upon you or you're going to have to start practicing Sharia law. I mean, it, <laughs> it wasn't that long ago, right? Where, where the entire conservative movement was um, was sort of centered around the idea that Sharia law was coming. In uh, September or, or October, a guest on, on Tucker Carlson said Biden wanted to implement it, which is yeah. still a thing. <laughs> and in this case, the question is, will saying that you're a victim of election fraud in this state, Georgia, with these elected Republican officials, will that convince people to go out and vote or will they say well i'm not going to be victimized anymore i don't know it's a good question uh maybe we can ask that of uh, ryan grimm who i believe is here uh ryan grimm the chief of the washington bureau of the intercept is uh coming to the floor here he is he's connecting with audio uh ryan well thank you for dressing up for this yeah you got it you know, I'm so used to uh, Skype that it's hard you know, for these kinds of interviews. It's hard for you know, remember, I have to actually do things other than answer. I see. I so, see what you're saying. Uh, so you were, you were standing by. I'm just sitting here like, <laughs> where are these guys? <laughs> <laughs> Going well, on here. Uh, well, we appreciate you uh, better uh, slightly, slightly late than never. Not very much. Um, all right. Well, we were just. We were a just talking about Georgia. Yeah. A review of the correspondence would show that it was thoroughly my fault. So. All right. Well, uh, we will not uh, we will not do that until you are off uh, the uh, program so that you do not have the ability to defend yourself as we uh, <laughs> as we show this. But uh, Ryan, uh, Emma Viglin is here uh, with us as hey, well. Emma. Hey, what's up, Ryan? I want to uh, talk about, um, you know, obviously a little bit about uh, Georgia and uh, the election. But first, um, if we have time, but first let's talk about a piece that you've written. And I've, and frankly, I've, I've seen since your piece has come out, I've seen a couple other pieces that have sort of shadowed this theme. Um, I think it's similar to one that we've talked about on this program. And you wrote this piece before, uh, Javier Becerra was picked, which I want to <coughs> get to, but the nature of it was essentially comparing, uh, Biden's nascent cabinet, if you will, uh, and extended cabinet to Obama's. And basically, give us the, uh, the elevator pitch for that and the, before we get into it. Well, the, the elevator pitch would be that if you compare those two administrations, which is you know, not something you're just plucking out randomly. This, we're talking about the previous Democratic administration and the, the following Democratic administration. If you compare both the transition processes and the results, uh, you, you've seen vast improvement um, from, from one to the other. Now, people can, could certainly take that too far and say that, therefore, Biden is doing well. No, not, that, that, that doesn't necessarily follow from there. It might just be, it might, it might say more about Obama, in other words, than it says about Biden. That's interesting, uh, because Biden, I mean, I think it's fair to characterize him as as about as um, 
it's about as a as much of a weather vane right. as uh, of the Democratic Party as anything else over the years. Right. Yes. So you know when he from the time he came into office back in 1972, he has uh, assiduously positioned himself right smack in the center of wherever the party was. You know, if the party moved left on an issue, he moved slightly left, but made sure he was still in between. You know, you know, you know. So when he came in, he's positioning himself himself in between the Dixiecrats on one hand, and some and some awfully progressive, you know, early seventies Democrats. And so that you know that puts him kind of all over the place. As the party moves right in the eighties and nineties, you know, he moves right with them, but but stays in in the center. So he leads the Biden crime bill. But he's also at the time, you know, a, a, a big, you know, working with the NAACP to make sure that NAACP's concerns are, are part of the crime bill. You know, he's 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 not the Strom Thurmond wing of of this of this effort. And so, yeah. So now that the party since 2008 has has shifted back in a progressive direction, you know, he's he's moved along with it. He's he's more of a follower throughout his career than he has been a, a kind of setter of the agenda. Um, let's start with just sort of the, the, the broad process. And, um, you would tell this uh, story, which I've, I've mentioned on this program quite a bit, but this was reporting that came out and it centers around this guy, uh, John Froman, who, uh, ultimately became, um, uh, president Obama's chief trade negotiator, um, and marshaled the PPP, which became, rather unpopular by the end of the um, uh, Obama administration. Um, tell us about that story and, and how that sort of um, uh, contrasts with the right. Biden administration's uh, process. So every transition starts a little bit before the election. And so in October of 2008, Froman, who ends up becoming, not, you know, like you said, the trade representative later, but he was the transition chief. You know, this is the guy who runs Obama's transition in the fall of 2008, he's at Citigroup and he begins the transition process and uh, sends out a thorough memo to to John Podesta, who was uh, kind of a chair, you know, kind of a, a, you know, a senior figure in the in the Obama world and says, you know, here are here are my thoughts on how we start this transition process and who we look at. And if you look at that memo and the names that he put out, uh, almost all of them wound up in the precise positions that he you know recommended for them no doubt re related to the fact that he was became the <laughs> transition chair uh so he sent this email though which is what's so remarkable we, the, the, uh, from his actual city group email you know he didn't even fire up his gmail <laughs> right. to to kick this process off so obama's transition literally launches uh you know from from city group and then you end up bringing in, you know, a significant number of of, of Citigroup honchos, including the, some of the most famous, like Bob Rubin, uh, you know, who created the Rubin wing of the of the Democratic Party. You know, he really brought Wall Street in. Uh, Larry, you know, Larry Summers, uh, who was kind of a Rubin uh, protege and, and also represents that kind of wing of the party, comes in. Peter Orzag uh, reversed. You know, he became. Uh, Obama's OMB director, but left for Citigroup later. Um, and, and Citigroup was well represented, but they weren't the only ones, you know, that were represented in Wall Street. A bunch of other financial executives come in, even the people from the public sector that come in, like Tim Geithner as Treasury Secretary, are, you know, have strong, you know, social and cultural links to, to Wall Street and were, you know, were, were backed by, encouraged by, supported by, approved by, uh, approved by Wall Street. And so, you know, that is a contrast to uh, the way that is going, the way that is happening this time. And if you compare, you know, one to one, you know, pretty much on every position, the, the, the person that Biden is, is picking um, is, is an improvement over the person that Obama picked in that particular position, even if you don't uh, love them on their own. Well, can I, you compare the 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 BlackRock uh, comparison, the fact that Brian Deese, top economic advisor there for Biden and uh, the number two now under Janet Yellen, which seems to be kind of a stopgap or a check on her progressivism? Like, I, I still agree with what you're saying about how uh, Obama's transition team was clearly handpicked by Citigroup. But 
there are some troubling signs that BlackRock uh, is basically infesting parts of the administration. Yeah, for sure. And so, but even on those, uh, the, the one-to-one comparison is revealing. So for, for Brian Deese, Obama had Larry Summers. So there's no, right. no, no question that not Larry Summers is better better pick than than Larry Summers, even if even if it's Brian, Brian Deese, who, who actually has some progressive supporters. Bill McKibben, for instance, is a supporter of him. You can't find any progressives out there, really, who, at least in 2008 or nine would have said, oh, great, you know, th- this is Larry Summers. That's somebody we can we can work with. Um, and then the other one, Neil Wolin, uh, to uh, to the, the current uh, number two, Wally Adeyemo. Uh, Adeyemo uh, also you know, worked at BlackRock as a Larry Fink uh, chief of staff for a while. Um, and it was a former uh, Geithner deputy. But N- Neil, Neil Wolin was a pure, you know, 100 um, percent Wall Street creature. So you've gone from like a pure Wall Street uh, creature to like a 50% Wall, Wall Street creature. So, you know, by, by no means are, are these folks kind of storming the Bastille. Uh, and that wasn't the point that the piece is making. Now, the, the question- but We, we just yeah. go into, go into Adiomo's uh, background just a little bit, because um, you write that Adiomo was foisted on, um, on Warren back in 2010 on the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau as almost a um, what do you mean by foisted? And then give us a sense of what happened once right. uh, he was there. Well, he's an interesting figure, and and people who know him um, talk, uh, you know, talk about his kind of intelligence um, and his competence in in ways that they don't about a lot of people in Washington, even even in a place like Washington where uh, you know you have a lot of brainy people. He's a he's a uh, a Nigerian immigrant who uh, went to a, a pretty rough uh, high school, public high school in, in Los Angeles. So has a different kind of background than uh, say like a Larry Summers coming up. Uh, he, he ended up becoming a treasury department official working under Geithner. And as a power move, when, when Warren over Geithner's objections gets the job of setting up the CFPB, Geithner says, okay, well, guess what? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm assigning you a chief of staff. You know, this is somebody who's going to, you know, you know, you know, keep tabs on you. And, and he started at the same time leaking things about, you know, how she had asked to have her office painted to like, you know, Wall Street, to the Wall Street press. And so this was all part of his kind of like, you know, backroom knife fighting that he was doing with her because he had lost the, the bigger fight to keep her out of the administration. And so at first, you know, the Warren team is like, Ugh, you know, we, we've got we've got. Uh, this this Geithner stooge, this Geithner plant that we're going to have to work with, but within several weeks, from what I understand, you know, they the they, they had actually developed a strong uh, working working relationship despite the way it started. And what people say about Adiemo is that he's somebody who's going to take in. You know, you you have different types of people um, that that work in government. Some are you know pushing their own agenda really hard, and you know. That might be a good thing. It might be a bad thing, depending on what your agenda is. Then there are other people who are just kind of in, in, in the government um, trying to do good by the government and, try, and trying to like listen to all of the different stakeholders, build a process so that a decision can, can get made and allow the people who are elected or appointed to ultimately make those decisions. But you set up the process. And people talk about Adeyemo as one of those people who would you know, listen to Warren, but would also listen uh, to Geithner. You know, so he's going to take uh, Bernie Sanders' phone call as much as he takes Jamie Dimon's phone call and try to set up set up the process like that. Uh, so he he so he's now number two in the Treasury Department, which you know if he continues along that pace, that means he's he's essentially going to you know execute uh, whatever Janet Yellen's vision is for for that department, it, ra- rather than trying to be you know an operative in his own sense. But I think Emma's question about BlackRock is. Is interesting, and we also that we should we should talk about the difference between BlackRock and a place like Goldman Goldman Sachs in, I in was kind of the, say, the global the global political economy. So BlackRock is this absolute behemoth of an asset manager. So they they go in you know and they buy massive shares of uh, of stock of publicly available stock uh, you know with pension money and with other. With 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 other with other funds, and then they can use that power that they have 
in shareholder meetings or, or elsewhere, but they're, they're, uh, they're kind of asset owners. Whereas Goldman Sachs is, is more on kind of the deal side, you know, so Gold, Goldman Sachs is behind the scenes kind of creating the conditions of, of the, of the global economy and, and profiting from it from both sides. You know, you know, they're, they're making money from, uh, the, the, the farmers and they're making money from, um, you know, the, the, the seed side and they're making money from, uh, you know, a- acquisitions and mergers, you know, they're, they're, you know, they, they've got, they've got their hands absolutely everywhere. Like right. Taibi called them, what, what did he call the great, the vampire, vampire squid, squid, because they've got all of these different arms and they're just funneling money out of, e- out of everything. And, and their incentive is just to have, just to keep, keep creating deals that keep aggregating more and more wealth, uh, up, up to the top. And so, no, those are two different elements of right. the global capitalist uh, system. When it comes to BlackRock, one of the most important public policy questions is whether they end up getting designated as, you know, ba- basically what they call too big to fail. Right now, they're not considered that, and they don't want to be. Des- nobody, no, none of these big guys want to be designated too big to fail because then they have more regulatory hurdles that they have to clear, more capital requirements it's, they have to. Huge create, indictment create a, on the system yeah. that they aren't yet considered that, given that they have massive investments in what, you know, 95 percent of uh, S&P 500 companies or something like that. Right. Because if they failed, like, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah. my God, like, like right. you don't have to, you don't have to dig too deeply through their books to understand that they're a systemically important financial institution. And so uh, the, so the, the, there will be a, there will be eyes on whether or not they get designated as such, because if they don't, then it's like, well, look. So what are you doing? You're hiring people and then sticking them in government to keep yourself from being designated as this. And to be clear, the Treasury Department oversees the regulatory agencies for the most part. I imagine there's mm-hmm. also some from the Fed, but um, that would push this designation. Right. Right. And in there, then there's some independence involved in this mm-hmm. and that. But yeah, but generally it's it's a political question and it's going to get resolved through political channels. And wh- do we have a sense of like, wh- when does, is that, is that a decision that is, you know, every uh, March 15th, there's a, a determination as to who's too big to fail or not? Or is this something that is just sort of floating out there? And um, do we have a sense of like, will we have a sense of, of, of whether that decision has not been made as opposed to it being imminent? Right. That, that's a good question. It's, I mean, it's more of a floating out there, but I think that, you know, at some point within the next, within the first few months of a, a Biden administration, you you should be able to get reporting uh, that that will show what what direction they're they're moving in in that question, and and maybe it'll end up backfiring that they hired all of these uh, folks because now they've raised the temperature and 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 put the spotlight on this question, and this isn't is is this really something that that Biden wants to go into the midterms and and into the next presidential election defending, you know, not not, you know, if, if he didn't designate a gigantic firm, that was just a kind of random gigantic firm. That's one thing. But if he doesn't designate a firm from which the deputy treasury secretary and the head of the NEC came, then that then that's a little more scandalous. So it, it, it kind of puts a reverse incentive on him to to actually do it. And they can afford it. Right. Yeah. Okay. Right. So you yeah, got more deal. paperwork. They, they can you, deal. You, you, you yes. can handle. <laughs> Although yes. that's usually not the threshold for financial institutions. They can afford a lot of things. <laughs> right. Yes. They, that's they don't want to. Point. Yeah. All right. Well, let's go through. Let's go through, through some of these other uh, names. We've we have we have talked about um, specifically in Treasury uh, Yellen and um, uh, Yellen and her uh, uh, deputy Treasury uh, Adiemo are. Um, you know, uh, upgrades, I guess, from the last administration insofar as they are not as, and I think this is the, the basically the story, right? Is that these, um, these are people who will not be obstacles if it, it to a, a process that could allow for progressive right. change. I know there's a lot <laughs> of qualifiers here. So, you know, I want to make it clear, like, you know, this is, we're, we're we are, one could argue that we're splitting some hairs here, but um, the Obama administration, in way they rolled out a response to the financial crisis, we are in many respects still feeling today, right. um, you know, as a first order and second order problem. Um, right. And, and, well, and, and here's a, let, let's do some examples of why, of why it matters, whether somebody is a kind of neutral player 
or whether they're actively you know, hostile and in bed with, with Wall Street. And the two examples to me, and they're kind of related, are uh, the foreclosure crisis and, and cram down. And so cr cram down was, was legislation that was probably poorly named and sloganeered uh, that would allow a bankruptcy judge to reduce the amount that you owe on your house down to what it was now worth. So you, you know, the you, principal, the, to be clear, right. the principal on the house, right. you bought it for $250,000. There's a massive housing crash. You go into bankruptcy. The market says that house is now worth 195. And um, there was a bill that was on the floor in 2009. Uh, Barack Obama had said in the election that he was in favor of that bill. Mm -hmm. He never fought for it whatsoever. And, uh, and they fought against it. And so like Larry, Larry Summers and other operatives in the White House, because they weren't just giving advice to the president, they became their own operatives. And so they went you know, to the Senate and, and lobbied Democrats against, against this legislation. That dynamic, I think, is the one that people really, it's, it's hard for people to understand because this, the government is so massive. And the... the I, it's it's almost impossible to know where Obama was on this specifically. He clearly was not making an active opportunity to, to rein mm -hmm. people in. It's also conceivable that he was only vaguely aware of what they were doing. Right. People are going over to the Senate and they're like, I'm, you know, I'm the, the assistant to, the deputy to the Treasury secretary. You got to listen to me. And this is a message that's coming from, you know, the president himself. I'm a senator. I may not have access to the president or I may have a list of agenda items that I don't. This is not what I'm going to bring up. I'm just going to fine. I'll, right. I'll vote against it. I mean, it, it's it's almost bizarre to contemplate. That's how our government works. But that's how our government works. Right. And the senator who was pushing cram down Byron Dorgan, you know, he believed and, and still believes to this day that without with, with White House neutrality, he would have gotten this 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 thing across the finish line. Which, which goes to what you're saying, that, that, that it's better to have people in place who will allow a victory if, if progressives can get together the organizing capacity, get organized labor, get, get grassroots folks, um, you know, whip the phones, you know, get, get the public support you need for an issue. You know, if, if you can do that, then you can pass it because there are so many veto points that if if you get somebody like a Larry Summers who puts his foot in the door and says, you know, I don't care that you have organized labor and you have all of these, you know, financial reform groups and you have this petition with 6 million names and et cetera, et cetera, you know, we're not doing it. And I have the power at the last minute to, to block you from doing that. You know, that doesn't mean that progressive change can't ever happen, but it means it's, it's that much, much harder. harder. Right. All so, right. Let's talk about some of these other figures. Cause I know you got a hard out here. Um, Ron Klain over uh, Rahm Emanuel, I think that like, <laughs> that's the perfect example of that, right? I mean, Rahm yeah. Emanuel at any opportunity where he could shut down progressives, both from an ideological and it, I think from a demeanor perspective, yes. he would take it. Ron Klain's almost the exact opposite. He's not necessarily carrying a progressive torch, but he is, his door is open right. to those people. Right, if he thinks he can do something progressive without it costing Biden anything, He's he's gonna do it, but let, that's the opposite. You know that that's not being like Bernie Sanders, right? Um, but like you said, yeah, Rah, Rahm Emanuel, if if he saw an opportunity to crush uh, the left, even if it cost him a little bit, you know, he he would take it because he has has so much kind of hostility toward that wing of the party. And we should say it's not just like personal animus. Like he his agenda was such that right. a disempowered left. Um, was necessary for him to carry to to right. to to push forward his agenda. Let's um, let's go to let's talk about Neera Tandon because um, <laughs> at the very least, and and, and I and I, I I think that you know my sense is sometimes this gets overstated. I, look, I I have had my own um, exchanges with Neera Tandon online. I think it's very hard to find anybody who is even nominally uh, you know to the left of like the, uh, you know, the, the center right in the party who hasn't. And even then maybe um, there's a big story in the Washington post today about how just sort of like, um, like just utterly um, super saturated the yeah. center for American progress was in corporate and in really um, malignant foreign money uh, yeah. in many respects. Um, 
but give us your sense of like uh, of Tandon in this because I, I don't know. I just think anybody who's tweeting that much, uh, there's <laughs> I, I think like it's it's an odd choice to to take if you're the you know. But that's it, it yeah. seemed to have worked for her. <laughs> well, the, the n- nice thing about her getting nominated is it, she's been pretty quiet on Twitter. She hasn't called me not a journalist for a couple <laughs> a couple weeks now. <laughs> has, progress. Has an atta- yeah, it is progress. That's how um, we had so, the window to open to bring you on the show. There you go. Yeah. So again, if you, I don't actually, I think that her path to confirmation is a very difficult one, but let's, let's just talk about her as, as, as an appointee or as a nominee, you know, first of all, compared to the Obama administration, Peter Orzag was one of those people who isn't, who wasn't a neutral kind of uh, budget counter, you know, bean counter. He was somebody who had a fierce uh, ideological opposition to any deficit spending. You know, he, he wanted to cut social security, Medicare, Medicaid, his, his mission um, in life really uh, was to, you know, lower, lower, lower federal spending um, and reduce deficit spending. And, and he, you know, used his considerable intellect and talent in, inside the administration to, you know, hamper all sorts of, uh, you know, uh, progressive, progressive efforts. And then went on to, to Citigroup. He's now at Lazard, uh, this gig- gigantic mergers and acquisitions firm. So that, so, I mean, compared to Orzag, you know, no, no question, but even compared to the choices that were, that were up now, it was either Bruce Reed or, or Neera Tannen, apparently. So, and Bruce Reed is extremely close to, to Biden, has been a close aide of his for decades, co-founder of the, of the DLC, which um, the people might have to go back and read history books to learn about that. But th- that was, that was effectively the, the wing of the party that rose to counter the progressive wing and was funded uh, by Wall Street. And so Reed isn't just from that wing, but he also has a, as much of a, a messianic opposition to deficit spending as, as Orzag does. So I think, you know, people are saying, well, you know, Nira's really mean on Twitter. And yeah, she is. And if she goes down and gets replaced by Bruce Reed, I think it won't take long for people to figure out, um, you know, what a, what a, what a bad trade that was. How, if she goes down, it's going to be because of conservatives. Right. The, it's going to be because of Republicans. Right. How, how much does, was that, I mean, how, how much was that in the consciousness of, of the Biden transition team? In other words, and I don't want to get too, you know, conspiratorial here, but I mean, this is not a hard calculation to make. We put up near attendant, we check off the box of, providing a benefit for the Clintonites who supported us and she supported in this whole wing. That's our, our, our tribute to them. Uh, we, we show that we do this in face of the fact that maybe they are aware of the, you know, her, her perspective on, on Twitter. Maybe they're not, I don't know how um, I've heard reports that they say, well, you know, it had progressive in the name. Why aren't progressives happy? Uh, but they put her up. And, you know, on day, not even day one, you had a bunch of Republican senators saying, no way, this is going to be the one that we, this is going to be our, you know, this is what we're going to be taking for our people. Um, how, how, how conscious is of that? I mean, like, is this, is this a way to get, um, uh, to get, uh, uh, you know, their, the, their choice in without having to actually put their choice in? I, I don't I don't think so. I think it was more cluelessness. I mean, you know, there's been reporting that said that they thought they were going to make AOC happy uh, with this with this choice. Uh, you know, that, that it's they, they're super quote, in touch quote, with the grassroots. They yes, really they, are. They really, really nailed that one. I think it was Axios reported that uh, they saw her as a, quote, activist woman of color um, who, who AOC would uh, be happy with. Uh, well, and an AOC had, you know, they've been very publicly opposed to Bruce Reed. And so they, they kind of conflated some not pu- appointing Bruce Reed with the, her being happy about. Is there a third uh, choice? Yeah. Cause if yeah, apparently goes- there are only two people that are capable. No, I mean, there, are there any well, groups a, there's lots right of, now? There's Pushing lots. A third th- choice. Uh, I, I don't, I haven't seen that because the process is, is underway. You know, they could also just uh, skirt it and do what the Trump administration did and put people in and, in an, in an acting role. Um, and I vote just, for that. Just, um, just right, well, listen, we only have a couple of minutes. I want to ask you about Becerra. 
because right. um, we have someone who served in Congress for off the top of my head, I can't remember, but maybe like, uh, half a dozen or more uh, mm-hmm. uh, uh, terms. Attorney General of California has sued uh, some of the pharma um, uh, industry in California, uh, um, very strongly um, uh, been associated with like uh, going after pharmaceutical companies to cut down on uh, prices of, of uh, pharmaceuticals. Also associated with support for Medicare for all, but not necessarily has the executive chops that one usually sees at an agency like HHS, particularly at a time where we're in the middle of a pandemic. What's your sense of, of this pick? I mean, certainly it seems better suited for progressives, at least on an ideological level. Oh, for sure. And they dodged a huge bullet with Gina Raimondo, uh, who's the you know, governor of, of Rhode Island. Uh, who, who apparently was, you know, extremely close uh, to, to getting named. You know, Raimondo, uh, v- very close ties to Wall Street. Uh, her, the, the most significant thing she's done in her career is, is this rating of, of pension funds that has turned organized labor into, into absolutely passionate opponents of her. Rhode Island has the worst, uh, you know, COVID, has the worst COVID handling in, in maybe the country, um, but currently, in, certainly in New England, which is saying something, New England's yep. doing, doing very, fairly well. And while other governors have been expanding Medicaid, she spent her, her tenure slashing Medicaid, which has led to closures of, of nursing homes, of, of hospitals, sales of, of hospitals, just, could, just would have been an utterly disastrous pick from a pro- progressive perspective. So just simply going from, from there to Becerra is, is something, you know, whether he can, you know, handle a, a bureaucracy like that, I think it is will be boosted by the fact that Ron Klain, who is who is known as kind of a, a logistical genius, uh, will make sure that in this most important position, you know, this is the, this is the position that's overseeing the the end of this pandemic, you know, you know, finishing this out and getting the vaccine out, that Ron Klain will be actively involved in making sure that, you know, the appropriate leadership structure is set up with people who with people who know what they're doing so it, it won't rely completely on on Javier uh, Becerra. Um, all right lastly how much can the sort of second level uh, deputies and whatnot how much can they gum up the works and you know who's on that beat because you know at one point it gets to be like I you know these are people I've never heard of and I would never hear of. Right. I mean they you know, if they're dedicated, they can, you know, that, you know, it, and it's, it's always easier uh, for a, a, a clever and sophisticated um, bureaucratic infighter just to stop something from, from happening than it is to actually uh, get something to happen. There's that, actually, there's that famous um, CIA guide to how to infiltrate uh, left-wing groups. Uh, and, and, it, and it has this, you, people could Google this, it has this list of suggestions of what to do in meetings, um, you know, throw out crazy ideas, uh, but then after after you're, after none of that works, uh, you propose that a committee study it. Uh, then you then you object uh, to the way that the committee was formed. Then you object to the way that the process uh, is playing out with it, within the committee. And there are all of these tried and true methods that that you see the CIA suggesting that it's that that it's people who are trying to subvert these left wing groups do that are done in bureaucracies all the time by, by people who are just, just trying to gum things up. And so if you know what you're doing, you know, with, with, the, with, with the right amount of malice, you can, you can create a, enough shenanigans that the clock just runs out. And in and, and Washington, there's, there's more to do than there is time because you know, pretty soon it's right. the, su- the first summer is here. Then you're coming back for the fall. And now in the first fall, now they're starting to think about the midterms. Right. And, you can, and you use all of that to just shut down anything. Ryan Grimm, uh, Washington correspondent for The Intercept. Thanks so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Don't forget, if you got a Zoom meeting next, you, you got to actually gotta click, click, the click the thing. Click yeah, it turns out. <laughs> Ryan Grimm, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks, yeah. Ryan. <clears throat> got to say that, um, that, uh, that, that CIA strategy, gum up the works, sounds a lot like uh, Brendan in the office a little bit. Sounds but, like he's a CIA plant. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that. I'm just saying there's somebody's I'm, I'm been reading that. Oh, well, that's fair. My grandfather was uh, in the CIA for a little while. What? Mm. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, we, let's take a break uh, and discuss that at the break. We'll be back in just a moment. We got more.
We are back. Uh, so, uh, Emma, we had we played that clip of uh, Donald Trump in Georgia and him reminding all of his supporters that they are all victims. I mean, um, every he wasn't last say- one of you, you're a victim, you're a victim. He wasn't saying this in terms of like, you know, having having been citizens of the country and dealing with a, an administration that was not taking a pandemic seriously at all. And of course, um, in that sense, they are victims and we I mean, all are. Yes. Victims in, of uh, Trump administration malfeasance out of the mouths of, of babies, uh, I guess. Uh, sometimes you hear some truth. Um, and we should say, obviously, the the covid numbers are um, just devastating. We have hit a, another record of infections. Um, we have now in California, the the governor over the weekend uh, ordered basically stay at home orders for about 85% of the state because they have these thresholds where ICU capacity, if it gets um, below a certain threshold, the they they will institute these orders in um, there are two regions, apparently, the uh, in Southern California, the rate fell to 12.5 percent under the 15 percent threshold for ICU beds or capacity. Um, and in the San Joaquin Valley, it dipped to 8.6 percent. And there is no reason to believe. Now that we are two weeks out, not even two weeks out from Thanksgiving, that these numbers are going to go anywhere except for down in terms of capacity. And this is, this is the, 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 the most paramount fear that public health uh, folks have, which is obviously you don't want 280,000 deaths in a pandemic and counting. Um, you don't want over 100,000 people in your hospitals. But what you really desperately don't want, what flatten the curve meant, and it's not a term that we hear anymore, but what flatten the curve means is we cannot have such volume of people getting infected because that will lead to such a volume of people being hospitalized that you will not be able to even care for the for a certain percentage of those people because you simply don't have the beds or really more importantly the staff to help these people and so you got to start making decisions triage decisions as to whom we will deal with and so um this is what california is facing and i imagine we're going to start seeing more and more stories about this around the country as the the COVID numbers just continue to climb, particularly in the wake of of Thanksgiving. Well, which is why it makes Donald Trump's rally in Georgia as his most visible ally, Rudy Giuliani, test positive for COVID yesterday. That's what makes it even more egregious. We're all numb to the fact that the president of the United States, lame duck as he is, but he's leaving office and he continues to host rallies, um, massive, unmasked, super spreader events in complete defiance of public health and with complete indifference to the deaths and the strain that it puts on healthcare workers. And so we can become immune to these things, no pun intended, yeah. intended, but that is the, the stark reality of the pathology of Trump and the people surrounding him. The entire Arizona legislature had to shut down uh, for a week after Giuliani, in the wake of basically Giuliani's um, half announcement, I guess it was Trump who actually announced it, uh, announcement that uh, Giuliani tested positive. Now, Giuliani is in a hospital, reportedly, in Georgetown. Um, It's unclear what his condition is. Um, We know that you have almost, I think it's 53 people now in the uh, Trump orbit who have contracted uh, COVID, it is uh, more than likely that a lot of these people, not all of them, but certainly someone like Giuliani probably has access to uh, some of these um, 
still experimental treatments that uh, seem to inhibit COVID right at the, if you get this treatment early enough. These treatments are, of course, not available, despite the fact that a month or so ago, uh, Trump said it was going to be available to everybody. Um, they're available literally to a handful, literally a handful of people. Um, never mind the cost, which is in the tens of thousands of dollars. But the, uh, the just the, there's just not access to the this stuff. So this is a, um, this couldn't be more, you know, we hear a lot about like the elite and whatnot. Like there's really no better example of who the elite is in this country. If you uh, get a diagnosis of COVID and you're immediately um, uh, given, and Chris Christie went through this as well, given uh, immediate access to some of the top hospitals in the country and given some of the top experimental um, drugs for this disease, there, there, there couldn't be a better definition of what constitutes the elite, right? Well, I mean, certainly. I mean, but it's all about how elitism feels, right? So we talk about how Trump, um, you know, is is saying all of you are victims, right? That is a feeling. They feel victimized, even though in actuality, when it comes to um, racism and class dynamics in this country, like a lot of the Republican base, they they're not victims uh, per se, but um, Trump doesn't feel like an elite, right? He talks like a regular Joe, but when it comes down to everything behind the scenes, he cuts corners to screw over the little guy every single chance he gets. And as does Rudy Giuliani, as we're seeing. Um, here is, uh, let's go back to that, um, uh, that, that rally in Georgia. Um, I noticed this guy. I mean, I, I I knew who this guy was years ago because he advertised so much on conservative talk radio and the, you know, conservative talk radio, the advertising, it's was probably not that different from uh, left wing talk radio. Although when we worked at uh, Air America, we didn't have buyers who sort of understood this dynamic uh, because when you live when there's only one option, right? It's much harder to see the dynamics that are going on there. But uh, this guy, Mike Lindell, would advertise for years on WABC, uh, on Sean Hannity's program, this and that. And when I did live coverage of the debate between Trump and Clinton in Las Vegas, Nevada, after the debate, there's a big... I mean, I guess it's like the red carpets, right? Where there's like these gated areas where all the reporters stay around it and the sort of uh, the stars of the celebrity, in this case, it was like the Trump team, uh, were walking around giving interviews. Um, in that pit was uh, James O'Keefe, who uh, was from Project Veritas, and another guy was Mike Lindell, walking mm -hmm. around traveling with them five years ago. Lindell is still a big uh, Trump supporter, even more so. Um, and, uh, here he is CEO, Mike Lindell of my pillow with his idea of what should happen in Georgia. And, uh, this is quite something. How do you not put people in prison, but the most, you know, they will be going to prison, but in the meantime, December 14th is so important. We have to get this governor in here, governor Kemp, Brian Kemp has to give an order to, get, to have a meet, to have a, a Congress meeting or whatever they do, their legislators and pull Georgia down and don't give it to Biden. It doesn't matter who they give it to. Don't, don't give it to Biden. Just let, and, and find out all your corruption. Because if you pull down Georgia, Pennsylvania, and crooked Nevada, now nobody has 270. And then it goes to the December 14th vote and Donald Trump wins the election. Wow. I love, I love your, your passion and motivation. Mm -hmm. That's one way of putting it. Passion, <laughs> delusion complete authoritarian uh, tendencies, somebody who would literally jump off a bridge or figuratively, I should say, if Trump told him to. I mean, it's yikes. what's also impressive about this is it's not clear that even if all of those things now, uh, he didn't know it at the time because it didn't happen until today, but the Georgian um, vote was recertified. Again. It wasn't just certified once, it was certified twice. Uh, today, but well, what about crooked Nevada? 
Well, here's the funny thing about this. So between Crooked Nevada, um, what, what does he have a nickname for Pennsylvania? Poor Pennsylvania. Um, um, well, yeah. I, I don't know. But what, what, I'm trying to think of something else. I, I, I don't know. Criminal uh, North poopy Carolina. Pennsylvania. Oh, wait, no, I'm not sure. And um, <laughs> go away, Georgia. Ger, Ger, I don't know. Um, I'm trying to come up with nicknames. They're not doing very well. Uh, but the if off the top of my head, we're looking at 20, 16, and six are the respective electoral votes from those things. It would uh, it would drop uh, Biden. Uh, he's at 306. It would drop him by 42. So he'd be six under. And I guess the idea is that the vote would go to the delegations in the House. Is that it? My understanding is like if that even in that scenario, um, because it would be those three, I, I'm not quite sure, but that doesn't still get uh, Donald Trump the presidency. I think. Are like, you telling me that the my pillow guy's math is off? Well, I'm not sure it's so much of this math, but I think he might not be aware of like which delegations would vote because there wouldn't be enough um, elector, uh, you know, particularly if it was given to somebody else, uh, there wouldn't be enough votes for for Donald Trump in that case. But I guess the uh, the the bottom line is um, that's not happening. And <laughs> yeah. the real question, again, you know, we asked this at the beginning of the show. The real question is, how does this implicate the Georgia runoff. And by all accounts, the polling is extremely tight. Um, the, and by the reaction of Republicans, they're very concerned. I mean, they're, they're having concerned. an all-out blitz about this. Very concerned. Um, Schwartzman, the, uh, the big financier who uh, supported Donald Trump, who came out and said that he had lost apparently has um, given $15 million to a PAC um, in that race. You know, the one wonders if, and, and there has been a barrage of negative ads, particularly deployed by Leffler uh, on a Warnock. And then I imagine there's been some negative ads also uh, headed towards David Perdue, not too hard to do, uh, seeing how it appears that he's been using his Senate seat as basically his own personal sort of like um, forerunning Bloomberg terminal. Uh, well, so to, has so has Leffler. I mean, that's what's amazing. It's like a prerequisite for being a Republican senator from Georgia. You have to uh, potentially illegally use your Senate seat to enrich your stock portfolio. Yes, uh, it's a nice job, I guess, if you could get it. Um, he's basically, Family values, then stock trading Ill illegalities, potentially. That's he's it. basically like a, a day trader with a Senate office is basically what we're seeing here. But right. all right, uh, folks, we'll have more uh, to talk about uh, tomorrow on this program. Thank you for joining us uh, today. Um, of course, uh, you can if you missed any part of this program, you can see it on the Peacock app on the Choice Channel, 5 p.m., 10 p.m., and then through the evening. For those of you who are sticking around for the rest of the show, stick around for the rest of the show. Uh, we will be headed into the fun half in just a moment. We're going to take your phone calls, uh, take your IMs. Just a reminder, this program relies on your support. You can become a member by going to jointhemajorityreport.com. When you do, uh, you support the free show and you get uh, extra content. Also there, you can find a button on the top of that page, jointhemajorityreport.com, and where you could um, give someone the gift of the Majority Report. Speaking of gifts, shop.majorityreportradio.com. Check out our merch. Uh, we've got carpenter pencils. We've got hoodies. We've got hats. Uh, mugs. Got to get out. some of that merch. I do. Yeah, we got to get you some of that merch. You got to swag me out. Yeah, we got to do a swag from... thing. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, check that out. Also, justcoffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code MAJORITY, get 10% off. Uh, you can buy the uh, Majority Report blend. Have you ever had any of that uh, Majority Report blend coffee, Emma? No, not yet. I mean, do we um... not have any more left in the. Um... And I've been spoiled that I'm definitely getting a, a coffee maker for Christmas. It was leaked to me. Oh. So I'll definitely be using that. 
Oh, that's oh good. Emma's got sources in the North Pole. I know. Well, I just have a very loose-lipped family. <laughs> well, that's uh, that's pretty good. Um, uh, we will get you uh, some uh, Majority Report blend. There's a couple of different blends I like. Majority Report uh, is is a go-to, but obviously, right. but uh, I like to mix it up. I've been having bit. the uh, the bike fuel blend lately. That's one of my favorites too. I have to say, bike fuel like Majority Report is a medium blend. Um. Bike fuel, if I remember correctly, is a dark. Is is that right? Dark roast. I think it might be the other way around, actually. Really, I, think I prefer majority dark report roast, is so. a dark roast, and uh... no, majority report is a medium roast. The um, what is the one that I get all the time? Shoot, the one that I'm drinking right now actually is a dark roast. But you know, the funny thing is, lighter roasts have more caffeine. That's a little something for you. Is that true? Um, yeah, it is true. Um, where's Jamie? Do we have Jamie for uh, check out the Antifada? Patreon.com slash the Antifada. Maybe she'll be coming up in just a sec. Uh, also, uh, Matt, what's happening on TMBS? Uh, TMBS, we had a wonderful last week. People should check out if they haven't. Zizek and Cornell West and uh, Russell Sbiglia of Seton Hall University talking in an amazing discussion on this uh, Michael Brooks tribute series. So go check that out on the YouTube page, folks. Uh, Literary Hangover, I'll be doing a Twitch stream tonight. And uh, on Thursday night, David and I will be streaming from the Left Reckoning YouTube uh, page. So oh, is, are, are you guys things. doing Left Reckoning on Thursday nights? Uh, yes, that is going to be our uh, left reckoning night. Okay. Um, awesome. Check out, uh, well, I guess we'll check out the Antifada at patreon.com slash the Antifada. Also, uh, don't forget to check out, uh, Nomiki's show. You can find that at youtube.com. The Nomiki show. Um, we'll take a quick break, head into the fun half. And for it. All right, folks. Six four six two five seven thirty nine twenty. See you in the fun. Are you ready? Who, who sent us this? Anarchy. Alpha males are back, 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 back. Boy, back. And the alpha males are back, back. Just as delicious as you can imagine. The alpha males are back, 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 boy, back. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. Just want to degrade the white man. Alpha males are back, back. I take all of it to my throat. Alpha males are back, 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 back. Almost says what? The alpha males are back, 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 back. You are a madman. And the alpha males are back, back, back. I, I, I am a total cunt. Bring back DJ Danner song, please. Yeah, or a couple of them. Just put them in rotation. DJ Danner. Well, the problem with those is they're like 45 seconds long, so I don't know if they're enough of a break. For people. That's fucking nonsense. Hey, folks, <laughs> reminder. I do not have Parkinson's. And the alpha males are psych. Fuck them. Fuck them. Fuck em. Fuck em. <laughs> Almost says what? What 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 Have you tried doing an impression on a college campus? I, I think that there's no reason why reasonable people across the divide can't all agree with this. Psych. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. And the Africans are black, 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 black African. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. And the Africans are black, 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 black. Out there, doesn't a little part of you think that America deserves to be taken over by jihadists? Keeping it at 100. Can't knock the hustle. Come on! Fuck them! Fuck them! Fuck them! Fuck them! Fuck 
things I do for the bigger game plan. By the way, it's my birthday. It's my birthday. Happy birthday to me, Jew boy. I have a thought experiment for you. And the alpha males are back, back. Africans are black, black. Alpha males are back, back. Africans are black, black. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> what? Come on. What? Come on. Three. Someone needs to pay the price of blasphemy around here. I, 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 I am a total pussy, total, pussy, total, pussy, total. pussy, 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 pussy. You're muted. All right, we're back. Uh, Jamie is going to join us on Wednesday. Um, and. Oh, what was the other thing? Oh, and apparently uh, bike fuel is medium rust. That are, those are the two uh, notes I got during the, um, the interim. But I uh, looked up, it's Maya Super Dark. That's, that's, that's one of the rusts I really wow. like. Wow. That is, it's, it's great. And they have some uh, single origin, I guess, um, roasts up there right now. So people should check that out. Just coffee dot co-op. Um, they're can great. We just... Oh, go ahead. What? I was just going to say, can we return to Mike Lindell for a brief moment? Oh, of course. Are <laughs> you kidding? You could spend the whole show on him. Which Mike Lindell do you think was evident in that interview uh, from the like gimmick book cover he has here? <laughs> Uh, from crack addict to CEO. Like, I think we saw a little bit more of the second guy there. I hope he's doing okay. Uh, yeah, that was, um, that's like a, a real theme with these Trump administration or the Trump orbit diehards. Like they're very hyper, suspiciously <laughs> so. Hope he's doing all right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, everybody who's going through addiction needs support. I think it's weird the way Mike Lindell talks about him being cured of addiction. That's not normally how I hear people talk about it but you know right whatever works right. for him the idea being like i'm managing my addiction yes exactly right right you know uh when you get to the top of the the heap of pillows as it were and he has the guy's been hugely successful with this uh with the with my pillow uh sometimes you look down you wonder like what's it all about and so mm -hmm. sometimes that can be a little bit um it's like the princess and the pea, except with the crack rock on them. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I mean, I, it's long at the top of the I don't know. kingdom. I mean, yeah. do you think that I, I actually, love the princess and the pea visual? <laughs> I find it hard to believe that, uh, that, um, uh, what isn't really going around there is more like an Adderall thing. They, yeah. cause I think like that is, that seems to right. be like a prescribed family, uppers, which makes it socially acceptable. Yeah. Much more, uh, socially acceptable. Uh, for that um let's turn to georgia since we are uh still uh referring to it um here is the lieutenant governor of georgia and this is such a like you know i this whole thing where you give republican operatives multiple opportunities to sort of say like D can you say it now can you say the words now? Yeah. This is so much misses the point, it seems to me, in many respects. It's like the bottom line is they were on board with this thing until it became just like they are beating a dead horse. And literally, you can't even tell it's a horse anymore. It's been beaten so badly. But well, they're they're working backwards from their desire for Republicans to be respectable, normal people, and society to be this bipartisan, beautiful fairy tale with a rainbow on top. Without, and this is going to be the theme. I mean, that's exactly right. This is going to be the theme that we're going to see. We're going to see this with like Bill Barr if he leaves, if he resigns. Like, oh, Bill Barr finally sees the light. Really? Does really? he? Really? Like, it's I. You know, it's like. How can we get these people off this sinking ship? Well, once the ship is like just completely underwater, then it doesn't matter if they're going to decide to jump off the ship. They're off the ship. They may be getting dragged down by uh, the, the sort of uh, that dynamic that happens when the ships sink, uh, that it actually creates like a little whirlpool and pulls the water down, or they may not. But they're not going to be on the ship. Uh, they're eventually going to be off the ship. Uh, that's what happens with a sinking ship. You will, uh, maybe, you know, maybe some of them lock themselves in the cabin and that's probably like, seems that, like the Trump move that, yeah, I don't know who that all. would be, but, 
Um, here is the lieutenant governor of Georgia asked uh, by John Berman on CNN. Was the Georgian election rigged? This is uh, this was on uh, today on a day where the Georgia election has been recertified, certified once and certified again. The question I asked you, I asked you that question phrased that way specifically. Was it a hard question to answer? Was the election rigged? No, it wasn't hard at all. You know, we, we, we this isn't a third world country here in Georgia. We've been running elections for a long, long time. And and certainly we are uh, we are working all together and we've got 159 counties. And, <laughs> and certainly we all try to hold each other accountable and make sure our standards are as high and as modern as possible. And, and certainly we're in the middle of that process. So it wasn't hard at all, you say. I want. There you go. It's not hard for you to answer the question. It's very sweet of him to. Yeah, this is a this is a good Republican who is right. able to just simply say, no, we didn't rig our election uh, via servers in Germany, Italy, right. Romania, et cetera. But they do do it in other ways. This is the good Republican that is a part of the Brian Kemp orbit that is notorious for voter suppression, so notorious that Stacey Abrams ran an entire campaign against him on that very topic as Kemp was overseeing that own election. Like, that was corrupt in and of itself, but you don't go to actually uh, changing the vote totals and upholding somebody who wants to do away with democracy and the will of the people. Like, that's the new bar. The bar keeps getting lower for Republicans, and the media keeps asking them to clear that bar when the bar is 20 stories higher than the the one that the Republicans keep setting for themselves. Yes. And I also wonder what that guy's doing on parlor. I'm gonna I'm gonna get into my parlor account and see. Like yeah, I just wonder like how how the the this is gonna be the dynamic, right? Where yeah. they go on CNN, they say something that sounds like, well, you know, normal, just normal. And uh then they're on parlor. Sam, are you going to even be able to log into Parler if you don't input your social security number? I know you bypassed I, that security I just put in, measure. I, whenever I got to do that, I just put in somebody else's. I just put in John Benjamin's. Uh, I just put in John Benjamin's social security number. So um, here's Donald Trump at that rally. You know, people really don't appreciate how much he gives and he gives and he gives. Um, here is Donald Trump talking about how selfless he is. I don't like doing it for other people. I said, David and Kelly called, would you do a rally? I said, not really. I did 56 of them in a little tiny period of time. I said, let me have. And I said, uh, when they asked, I, it was really not. But, you know, I don't do them for other people. It's a lot of work to do a rally. A lot of work. People don't realize when you do. I did five a day the last four or five days. One day I did six. Six. And the smallest one, think of it, the smallest one at 25,000 people. You think that's fun? In some of them, it's uh, 75 degrees, and in others, it's 20 degrees below zero, and you're doing them both. I'm saying, how's the weather out there? Sir, it's about 20 degrees below zero. That's good. Then I land the next stop. How are we doing? Sir, it's 82. Uh, it's so sad to see how much he is, he is, um, he's giving of himself and doesn't get the credit for it. You know what would also be nice? Um, squeeze in between those five rallies you're doing a day. Maybe just, I don't know, a little something to do with the coronavirus, the pandemic, the epidemic that is literally yeah. li l uh, lighting your country on fire. I mean, He's standing in front of a bunch of maskless people at a packed rally as we set a new record for COVID cases and deaths keep climbing. I guess there's an argument that, like, if he's out of Washington, he can't prevent people from doing their jobs, which is probably a positive. But this is just unbelievable. I mean, the idea that there can be people out there and let's, you know, put this in the right context, too. Not only is COVID on fire. The um, there is now a stimulus bill that uh, appears appears to be headed towards a vote, maybe one that will pass that is going to offer people um, uh, just pennies, pennies 
um, in terms of, like, I don't even know if there's a moratorium on evictions in this bill. There's going to be a, um, an extension of unemployment, but there is no, uh, uh, I mean, excuse me, there's going to be extra money for unemployment, but there is no word, at least at this point, as to what happens to all the people who are going to lose unemployment insurance on December 26th. I mean, it's- No it, stimulus I, check. No, no stimulus w- check. Word for- on eviction moratoriums, including the liability shield. And Nancy Pelosi is now happily taking this when this would have not been enough do, uh, with her purported stance just a few uh, weeks ago before the election. Look, I am glad for any money that's coming through at this point, although um, the it is highly problematic to have uh, a to have a a a moratorium or a a full on blanket immunity for these corporations, um, particularly when we could have gotten more money, like you say, a month ago um, yeah. for that same supposed um, restriction on uh, on on people's ability to get redress. But there has been this consistent approach by the democratic leadership that is we don't want to do necessarily too much now i get it the heroes act was passed that was three trillion dollars then she went down to 2.2 trillion dollars um but the bottom line is there is nobody nobody who can say that she worked this in such a way that even she had planned well okay or or publicly articulated if yeah. you were going to take this bill, you take double the amount of money a month ago. Unless, unless, and the only argument is they were afraid that Donald Trump was going to win the election if that was the case. But they and can't say that. They can't say that. They cannot and, say that. And there's there, though, Sam, is a recognition that stimulus helps the president, right? So why would they not? force Republicans' hands to include a $1,200 stimulus for Biden to sign. So now that Biden's in power, you're going to accept the watered-down bill that doesn't have stimulus in there? That's actually going to hurt the Democrats and Biden. Like, I, it's, I don't it's also know, politically stupid. But to be fair, at this point, okay, I mean, this is this is my complaint with Pelosi. At this point, I don't know what the answer is. Like, I don't know I how you... Yeah. I mean, like, what interest do the Republicans have at this point past the elections, what interest do they have in um, in stopping this bill? Now, you could maybe focus on a Collins, but Collins won. She's in office for six years. Who knows what's going to be, you know, what what's going to be an issue six years from now, if she's even going to, re- you know, run again. Uh, I suppose you could pressure Romney. The problem is, it's just not the votes there um, to leverage anybody, get them to break from Republicans. And so the the it is the bed has already been shat as it were yeah and there is no unshatting this bed um the only thing that is that going forward the the democrats can screw up it seems to me is to pass a continuing resolution that that goes all the way past uh the next two or three months because you still don't know what's going to happen in Georgia. And why would you why would you resist? Why would you avoid the opportunity knowing that maybe um, Georgia could could cut your way? Probably won't. Um, because any incentive the, de- the Republicans have now to do a an extended continuing resolution in terms of the budget. is still going to be there three months from now. If you're, you know, if you're going to convince uh, a couple of members of the Gang of Eight to do this uh, now, um, why can't you convince them to do it three months from now? The point is, is that the House is the only thing that Democrats can control, and yeah. they are wielding it. They are wielding it incorrectly, based upon their own assumptions as to what's going to happen. I didn't say in April we're going to get city and state funding as badly needed as, as we needed it. I wasn't the one who said that the leader of the Democrats in the house, the, the per the leader of the house said that. Yeah. And if that didn't happen, it is because her calculations were wrong. Her assessment of the political climate was wrong. 
And that's I'm, indisputably true. I mean, and I, just quick, quickly back to, to Trump there, you know, I mean, he is, I think, making, first of all, he's making it as clear as day that he doesn't care really about these silent races. I mean, he's saying it like they're not, they're not appreciating me enough, but what is so fascinating about that dynamic and what we have to look to for the Senate going forward and counteracting it is that even that tepid endorsement of wanting them to 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 win, I think could be enough to put them over the top because the Trump supporters are such authoritarians that even him showing up there and for 30 seconds mentioning Purdue and Leffler, like that could be enough. Do you yep. know what I mean? Yep. We'll see. We'll see. We don't know. Um, all right, let's go to, uh, <clears throat> the IMs here. Let's see. Take a couple of ones that came in earlier. Speaking of the difference in care, uh, between the elite and the regular people, my, oh, shoot, my wife and RN has COVID her symptoms worsened. And I took her to the ER since her O2 levels were consistently dropping below 94 and below 90 when she walked. They gave her a chest x-ray, sent her home two hours later with a Tylenol and a Z-Pak antibiotic. Had to take her to a different ER the next day and she was finally admitted. She's stable now, trending towards recovering, but no antiviral cocktail with blood plasma treatment, just dextamethasone and oxygen. Well, uh, I hope she's doing better. Um, very I'm so sorry. sorry. Um, Hey, Sam, San Joaquin County is Trump County, and they didn't have mandatory masking in several cities, also home to a large base of support for breaking Northern California into something called the free state of Jefferson. Oy, 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 oy. Um, wow. Let's go to the phones. What do we got here? Calling from a 256 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? This is Jacob from Alabama. Jacob from Alabama. How you doing, Jacob? I'm doing good, Sam. I'm doing good. Uh, I wanted to call about the uh, the union campaign going on at a uh, Amazon Fulfillment Center here in my state. Jacob, will you back off your um, uh, your phone or your microphone just a little bit? Yeah, sorry about that. Um, well, somewhere in between would be good. Okay. Okay. Here we go. How about that? That's great. That's perfect. All right. So you're telling us about what? Yeah. Uh, you, you mentioned it in, in, in your like opening headline, uh, like maybe a week ago, but there's a, uh, there's an Amazon, there, there's an election, a union election at an Amazon fulfillment center in Alabama, in one of the, uh, sur the cities surrounding Birmingham. And uh, this was, uh, yeah, if I remember the story correctly, the National Labor Relations Board, uh, they had been petitioned and they had granted. Um, and this is at a time, too, where there, I think there was reports of, of Amazon sort of broadly uh, doing a lot of anti-union activity these days. Right. That, yeah, that, that's correct. Um, it, it's, I, I'm not sure how coordinated those, uh, those media pieces were with... Uh, RWDSU's filing for the election, but 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 it was interesting the timing of all of that. Uh, but you know, us us in the labor movement, we're like really really excited about this. If uh, if this goes through, if, if these workers win the election, it'll be the first ever uh, union Amazon facility in the country. Uh, it's got a fifteen hundred employee bargaining unit, and uh, and you know it's in Alabama. I mean that's that like I'm really really excited about that i've talked to the uh talked to the people in that union you know they don't want to do any like media stuff right now they, right. they're really kind of being tight-lipped about the campaign and, and they want to kind of keep it close to home um and, and focus and focus on the issues but um we're going to be going down and talking to them doing some election day coverage uh, i'm really really looking forward to it uh, uh when is the election and, and, you know when I, is that I, and, and for, for a little bit of for a little bit of like a peek behind the curtain, you know, the NLRB, by law, you have to have at least 30 percent verified, 30 percent of the bargaining unit um, verified signatures for the NL to to be able to file with the NLRB to uh, to call an election. And most unions, uh, my co-host, uh, David, he's in the machinist union. I know that 
they will not they, they will not file for an election unless they've got seventy eighty percent of the bargaining unit um, signing saying that they want a union election. So I'm not sure exactly what RWDSU's protocol is, but you know I know that they they wouldn't they definitely wouldn't pick this fight if they weren't confident about it. Um, they've been putting in a lot of groundwork for this campaign for a long time, and I actually <laughs> I spoke to the guy right before it went public. And, uh, you know, he, he was like teasing me. He was like, oh, man, we've got big news. we got big news. There's a place, and I've got a bunch of signatures, and, man, you're going to be so shocked. And, and uh, yeah, I was So, shocked. wait, so, Jacob, <laughs> when, does this, when does this happen? When is the, the vote? Uh, so, the election has not been scheduled yet. There is a pre-election hearing with the NLRB on the 11th. Amazon tried to get the pre-election hearing with the NLRB uh, – punted to after Christmas. I, you know, I think that they used something about, you know, oh, it's Christmas, it's going on, it's we're not going to, you know, we're not going to have time to do this right now, um, which is, you know, it's silly. Uh, but, but I think the pre-election hearing is going to be on the 11th, and I think at that point is when they are going to be setting the date, uh, literally four to six weeks, you know, uh, you know nothing Really Four to six weeks from there, I believe, is when we can expect the election to happen. Okay. So we're looking at, you know, beginning to middle of January. All right. Well, Jacob, thank you for the call. Your phone's a little hinky, but um, keep us updated on that. That's pretty exciting stuff. All right. Will do. Appreciate it. Um, and of course, obviously, the attempt by Amazon here is to um, push the election as far in the future as possible because they probably know that the union wouldn't go forward unless they were confident, which means that they are going to need more time to start to figure out who are the, uh, the people in the union they should be attempting to dissuade from um, voting for the union, or I should say people who uh, have signed a desire to have a vote uh, in, in the, you know, from, from that voting. I mean, they, this is where they start their sort of like um, disinformation campaign about the union, et cetera, et cetera, going forward. You're going to lose your benefits. You're going to make, you're going to lose your jobs. Um, and so, I mean, this gives you a sense too as to why unions wanted card check, which essentially was rather than have a vote to have a vote, Let's just have the vote so that no intimidation practices or that first vote where you supposedly say we want to vote is the vote. And um, and then, you know, people vote for a union or not in that instance. But there's this long sort of very deliberate process, which, of course. If you're talking about there are two parties to this. It is the parties of people who want the vote. In other words, they want a change from the status quo, which is non-union to union, versus the corporation who wants to stop the unionizing. And so putting off the vote obviously benefits those people who are trying to change the mind. I mean, it's essentially like, hey, we got a warning for you. People want uh, a union in your shop. Oh, okay. We just need six weeks before we can basically tell them that they shouldn't have it. So that's basically what goes on. Uh, Having that trouble again where I cannot hang up on the... It's weird. Calling from a 575 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hello, this is uh, Jeff from New Mexico. Jeff from New Mexico, what's on your mind? Um, I'm calling because, uh, uh, and I had a quick question and maybe I'll take it off air. Um, um, my question is, is that w- w- with this Bi- Biden transmission, transition team and the kind of, and, and, and their ideas on changing over, I just wonder what's kind of going through their minds because the last time this happened, um, you know, the, uh, with the Obama administration and not really pushing forward a proper stimulus bill, et cetera, et cetera. They, you know, they lost the, they lost the house, you know, within, within, you know, within nine months. So um, I'm just curious why, I mean, I understand that they're centrist, but, but, but it seems odd that they wouldn't be 
straight up pushing forward the kind of policies that they they want to see right away. Well, okay. So first off, Democrats controlled the Senate and the House in 2008 going into into January. Right now, we don't know if that's going to be the case. They certainly had much bigger margins. Remember, they were just one away from having a filibuster proof margin in the Senate. Um, the so that's that's one difference. Um, the Obama administration didn't pass anything until till Obama was in office. There's nothing theoretically that precludes the passing of a stimulus now and the passing of a stimulus in, um, you know, February, if the Democrats win. The only thing that you would, would avoid doing now is tying the stimulus to a long-term budget bill, because then you're precluded from uh, passing a, an, an appropriate budget if the Democrats win the Senate. If the Democrats don't win the Senate, you know, I don't know. I mean, at 50, you know, if, uh, we'd have 50, I, well, it could be 52, 48. It could be 51, 49. Maybe you could peel one or two uh, Republican senators off. Maybe. Um, but it's not necessary. The, you know, the roadblock right now is Mitch McConnell. So that's why, but it, you know, but with all that said, there's also members of the economic establishment in this country who just never learned that lesson of the stimulus. I think to a certain extent people have, uh, but, but not, not as much as one would hope, but appreciate the call. Like, I think, you know, like I said, the bed has been shot. There's only so much now that can be done. And that's the point. Yeah. And it's also, it's not like this stuff wasn't predictable. If, I am able to talk to people who predicted this exact scenario. We talked about it on the show. I know, I know that we talked about the loss of leverage in that second um, uh, PPP bill back in early April. I, I, I remember, I remember the clip. We've we talked about it like half a dozen times since then, probably. I think we've replayed that clip more times than like, I don't know, um, than any clip maybe that we've ever done. Right. But now, you, I don't know what the answer is. Calling from a 917 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? What's up, Sam? This is Mike. Mike, what's on your mind? Where are you Call. calling from? I'm calling from Brooklyn. Mike from Brooklyn. What's on your mind? So over the last couple, I just found you guys like a month ago. Over the last couple of years, I was kind of like fed the right wing YouTube video feed, you know, through like Joe Rogan and then, uh, you know, leading to like the IDW guys and stuff like that. And when I found you guys like after the first debate, it kind of like purged all that two years worth of paranoia that those videos fed into me and then like worsened during the pandemic and I kind of listened to a, a bunch of your stuff over the last month or so and like that all just kind of left so is that by design on the right and and if so how the hell is it so effective what like, was the paranoia what was the paranoia like what tell me describe to me like what 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 paranoia I mean, like prepper stuff like you know, the, basically the country is being taken over by the radical left and, you know, we're all going to be purged if we have any, of, you know, and any other thought other than what they want us to have. And, you know, like just basically the, the, the more accepting that the public got with things like transgender and, and, and such, the more they fed a paranoia behind that. And it works. Right. You know, well, I mean, this I, that, but it, it influenced everything around me and, and had me worried about immigrants and the border and, you know, what's going to happen with my job if I say the wrong thing. And it, it's just like every single thing you could imagine was, was in a paranoid state based on these videos. You uh, know, and I don't think it was conscious. I think it was completely subconscious on my end. You know, you know, I'll tell you something. First off. 
I, and forgive me for this, but the first thought that I have is that I would say, thank you, Mike, we have traced your number. And then all of a sudden, like five, like commandos would come smashing through your window from, I, part of that is just a function of, part of that is a function of my having watched too many Avenger movies with my son over the past two or three weeks. So uh, I apologize for that. That would be the funniest response that I could give you. But let me ask you this. What? Okay. So give me, just give us, I don't want you to give too, anything too specific, but give me a sense of like your age, your profile, because there is no doubt. I don't know how conscious it is they do it, but I have been saying for years that the right nurtures this, what I call a Masada complex. Masada was uh, this um, a holdout of Jews in the Roman times who were on this like hill and this fortified hill. And they were up there for like two or three years, but they were constantly under siege. And, and, and I think the right, there's two things that they create uh, that their rhetoric attempts to go for. It is that sense of aggrievement, which is really consistent and really on a spectrum of this sense of like you're under attack that, you know, like I said, just moments ago, that um, your marriage is under attack because gay people are going to get married. Um, your, uh, your country house in, uh, on the lake in, Mini in, Mini in Minnesota is under attack from a caravan that's uh, 2,000 miles away. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm, in, I'm in Brooklyn, and I found myself fighting with my sister and brother-in-law about Mexican people coming over the border. Like, it's the most asinine thought that one could ever have in their life. You know, I'm thir like you asked, I'm 39 years old. I'm from Brooklyn. I've always been here. My families are, my parents are immigrants. You know, I'm first generation here, college graduate. I work a good job. From, you know, uh, from where? I have a two-year-old daughter. Uh, but from, what, what, where are your folks from? Worry about, we'll say that again. Where are your folks from? Italy. Okay. All right. Yeah. But why would I ever, what, my, my parents are immigrants. You know, what, why am I trying, why am I dying on this hill in an argument with my family? It just makes no sense. You know what I mean? And, and, and I found myself almost enraged by it at times. In, you know? in, and, and, enraged by what? By the fact that, by, by, that you were enraged by what? Just by the, the way it's framed that, we're, like you said, like we're being invaded. You know right. what I mean? Like we were being invaded and, and everything is going to change because of it. And, uh, you know, the, 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 the two polar sides are either let everyone in or don't let anyone in. Right. There was no I wasn't getting any middle ground or fair argument for both sides until I kind of bumped into you guys by accident. And then it was just literally, you know, one one YouTube snippet just showed like how how ridiculous is that thought? And, how did you come across the uh, laughing at those videos now? How you know? how did you come across the show? I mean, how did you just you just the day after the day after the first uh, debate, Trump and, and Biden debate, um, you were just like next up in a random video. Never heard of you guys before. No offense. And I'm an avid YouTube user, you know, like a. a uh, I'm, I'm on it six hours a day, you know, listening to all types of different stuff. And you were just next up. And I kind of listened to one and then another and another. And, and I just found my whole perspective on, on things just changed. Like that whole, like I said, that whole feeling of paranoia and worry. I was worried about the riots. I was worried about the looting. I was worried about the fires. I was worried about what was going on in Portland, that it was coming to my block. And kind of it just went away. You know, the thought just became ridiculous when I when I got the, your perspective of things, you know. And you're saying you've you've only been tuning in for around a month. That's a really quick turnaround. Well, I don't I, I don't know if it's exact. Whenever that first debate was, which the, the date escaped or a few months. Um, right, right, yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. But I just felt like more at ease with the political spectrum where I had thought the world was falling apart and my world was at risk in some way to um, kind of uh, a feeling of ease. Well, a, a different perspective. Well, I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad you didn't find uh, me too annoying. I think I was, 
a little bit drunk on that uh, debate, uh, if I remember correctly. <laughs> but um, that it happens. It may have not even been live. It may have been like an older clip that kind of I just bumped into and then kind of ran with and listened to, a you know, a bunch since. All right. Well, good. I mean, I think, you know, I, I think... Look, there's two different dynamics that are going on. One is is that they have a very good, particularly in the context of YouTube, right? They they all show up on each other's shows. They have a very much of a closed loop. Um, specifically, uh, there has been, you know, uh, Ruben, Rogan, Harris. I mean, they're on and on. The only person who's ever invited me to actually come on one of their shows was a Gavin McGinnis at a time where uh, he wanted to be the moderator. And I thought, nah, I don't think so. I'll, I'll, I will go and debate Gavin McGinnis uh, in that situation. Uh, but um, the, and, and part of the reason why I think they do that is to avoid allowing people to see another perspective. I mean, look, we're the only show, as far as I know, uh, that takes live phone calls. Um, I mean, I imagine there's others there's, I imagine there's others, but, um, but there's not many, let's put it that way. Right. And we do that so that, you know, I believe me, I, every day is my, my dream is that somebody will call in and have an argument with me, um, so that we can hear, you know, uh, uh perspectives that are, 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 are decidedly different than ours. But, um, I think to a certain extent, like, you know, they have a very limited, um, uh, source of, of information and they, it gets regurgitated between them. And um, I'm glad, you know, we, we could help. And uh, thank you for calling in and telling us about it. I appreciate it. And uh, keep listening. Yep. Thank you guys. I appreciate it. All right. Too. Thanks. There you go. Fear machine. Yeah. That's yeah. an awesome, it's, it's uh, incredibly encouraging how quick that turnaround was. Cause it just goes to show how, it's it's really a house of cards of of a house of fear cards if you will that's stacked by these right wingers and if you just have someone talking sense about it it, it, that's, it it doesn't hold up that well that's why me and michael's favorite joke about like sam harris was to call him <clears throat> a hysterical man speaking calmly because that's what all these guys are yeah. really like it's the same thing with brett weinstein talking yeah. to like his dhs connection and like oh is it a race war is it not well antifa they want to go there guys and it's like yeah people if this is the only politics you're getting i mean i mean it sounds like he's getting a lot six hours is quite a lot but a lot of people like then you're not going to spend much and that's your message of the day and <laughs> be afraid and and yeah. also like you look at like what you know just their what their their focuses are you know i mean that's why i w have such problem with people on the like you know supposedly like the center left like making these issues of the thought police in these i mean you are you are making editorial decisions when you you talk about these these things uh, to the exclusion of other things and that is just simply the fact, right? Like there may be some truth to, um, uh, you know, um, uh, overreach in certain campuses um, of, of, you know, speech codes or whatever it is. Um, but if that becomes the primary story and it's, I, you know, there are some people who like, you know, I don't, I don't say to, uh, you know, the guy who who's dedicated his life to uh, to challenging student loans like, hey, you're you're putting that. It's too important. The, the activism you're doing. But yeah. if you're if you're in media and you're putting out any type of, you know, I understand I, I'm a reporter. I'm on this specific beat and that's all I do. But in the context of like the, what we do here. Journalists who are, you know, and I don't necessarily consider myself a journalist or not. I'm not terribly interested. This is what I do. Um, I, 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 but but people who put themselves out there as somewhat generalists and they're focusing on one topic over and over and over again, like this is the thing that's going to destroy Western civilization. It gives people a warped sense of of like how important, how dangerous, how uh, real uh, that threat is. And the fact of the matter is, like you know, there yes. People are protesting in Portland. Um, yes, in Seattle, the you know there's a, there's a I don't know a, a block that has been occupied. Um, right. I mean, without I, even litigating whether these things are good things or bad things, 
the the implications of these things are really going to be just sort of ideas and whether they are carried through by uh, individuals in the future. It is not, this is not something that is going to, that is going to fundamentally alter the, you know, Joe Biden, let's put it this way, is not going to institute a, um, you know, uh, 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 and, and, you know, uh, Antifa uh, agenda. Yeah. And, and also, I mean, it's all theoretical arguments because that's comforting and right wingers don't have to actually back up their assertions with fact when they're all in this kind of, you know, free speech idea fear zone. It's not something that is grounded in what's happening in Congress or on the ground or anything like that. So it's almost a, a warm blanket for them in that area. And and the, the critique about how the left is always, you know, uh, in, in kind of their safe space, right? The right wing is in a safe space constantly where, speaking of editorial decisions, Shapiro's constantly making editorial decisions. I'm going to talk about this cultural issue. Like, was Harry Styles in a dress on the cover of Vogue magazine really the number one political conversation we need to be having right now? I mean, there he's trying to drum up certain emotions from yes. his viewers. It's not a news show. It's about eliciting fear, eliciting anger, fear of change. So the idea, again, it's just a, it, the irony of him being the facts over feelings guy. That's what he claims to be when his entire show is predicated on eliciting emotion. Totally. And and this is a conversation that we've had, you know, over the past couple of years, quite a bit on some level, which is the, the shorthand being the zero sum uh, argument. And um, which is that one of the things that's going on in our society is the law. You know, if you look at the social hierarchy, there is um, a slow but definitive change that is happening uh, where there are more opportunities for. And this is, you know, on some level, it is distinct from some ideological politics. In other ways, it's not. Um, but there is a loss of social hierarchy for white men in this society. Now, that has different implications for different uh, people, depending on your class. But and in some ways, that social hierarchy, particularly when there is more economic pressure on your class because of rising wealth inequality, because of um, you know less protections in the workforce, et cetera, et cetera, the grip in which you will hold on to that social um, hierarchy becomes tighter. And there's really two things that are happening that um, are not necessarily uh, associated with each other. One is there is a loss of, like I say, of, of status on a social hierarchy um, for white men. On the other hand, you have a general, not just uh, for white men, but for uh, pressure on the working class uh, in this country, um, that loss of social hierarchy is felt more acutely by white men because they're the ones who are losing it. And if they're in that class, they're going to respond in a certain way. This is in no way uh, to defend uh, you know, racism and bigotry and anger and hatred on behalf of those people. This is just a dynamic that I think is happening. Well, it's to explain why it's accentuated at certain times, I think. Yes, e exactly. And I don't, and, and, but, you know, and it's hard to sort of disaggregate. Is it, is it accentuated because of the economic situation um, these, uh, these people are in? Or is it accentuated because of demographic changes that are, you know, pushing it into, you know, that have accelerated over years because of, and, and we see it in culture, right? And we, I mean, it can be both, right? Like, I mean, it, and it, and it both. is both, but, well, and yes, also someone like, saying, Steve, someone like Steve Bannon, right? He consciously fed into that and created more of it by, you know, they talked about all of those online forums and the gaming culture that was the origin of the alt-right. This was part of, yes, cultural factors and economic factors, a confluence of them, but it was also procured and uh, gardened, if you will, specifically 
by people on the right who saw this as an opportunity, yes. Bannon being one of them. Without a doubt. He pulled uh, Milo Yiannopoulos out and was like, you're the guy who's going to cover this Gamergate. And that's a good example. And it, like I say, it's it's probably both. And it's unclear how to disaggregate it. It's not. It does not necessarily mean, in my opinion, I think others would disagree, uh, that it can it can be solved by offering material benefit. Although I think long term, it probably, I think it's going to be again. The I would say the remedy for this is um, equally tough to disaggregate and is going to involve both. One is just simply time, and the other is um, you know uh, providing less or, or 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 helping working class people across the board uh so that you know and i think like you know i, I can't remember in what context th this interview happened where it was like you know people are waiting in line for stuff and uh they resent that other they perceive maybe that other people now are cutting ahead of them in line or or that or that they no longer get to cut in front of line yeah, this is the um, Brazil and, the Brazil story of people saying the airports now look like bus stations because of the type of people that can afford to take plane trips now. Yeah, and well, we're going to have that problem with healthcare. I think. Well, but I'm not. I'm not. That this is a little bit different. I mean, I'm talking about um, you know, people are, are are in line and they need help and they resent this perspective that you know maybe they look around at what's happening culturally and say like, hey, wait a second, I'm 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 not. I've lost my position in line. Well, the idea is that maybe nobody should be waiting in line and therefore it is tough to develop those resentments. All this stuff is very hard to disaggregate. I am not convinced that there is any one answer to this, although I think it's a, I think it's a combination of a lot of things uh, that can that can remedy this. But um, the bottom line is we are living in an era where both a there is a sort of demographic reality and, uh, you know, not as quickly as it should be, but an emancipatory reality uh, in terms of women and uh, black people and brown people having a little bit more say in, at the very least, our culture um, than they um, have in the past, and maybe a little bit less in terms of power, but it's at least trending supposedly in the right direction. And economic conditions that are putting pressure on people and that pressure is not necessarily felt in the same way by everybody uh, or uh, you know some people may react one way versus reacting another way that doesn't justify uh, those reactions some people can say like there's no point in me engaging in the um, electoral process because I'm not going to get any benefits anyways out of this other people might say like I'm not going to engage in the electoral process but then uh, Donald Trump shows around and says like, oh, I got some demons. Uh, I got some people I can demonize for you who you can blame uh, for this, this frustration that you're feeling and they get activated, right? I mean, um, so uh, it, it, it's, it's a very tough uh, thing to disaggregate, but I think all these things are true. And I think part of the reason why you see the rise of like on YouTube and this and that is because you got a lot of, um, primarily men or boys um, who are interested in, in consuming this stuff, you know, 75, 25, 85 to 15. I, I don't know. know. I bet you some of those uh, shows go 90, 10, 95, five. I wouldn't be surprised in terms of males. Um, and maybe they'll be talking about my, uh, my tweet and, and well, be being very angry about that now. I mean, this is a good example of it. Like, you know, and there, there's a reason Should we why, talk about that. Or? Yes. This yeah. is the, the reason this is the, the, one of the reasons why Fox News down to all of the right wing uh, independent media um, have consistently attacked women. And if they can attack women who are young, they will do it. And if they can attack women, uh, young women of color, uh, they will do that too. I mean, AOC, just, just a way to set up uh, this thing, AOC has greater name recognition amongst conservatives than she does amongst liberals. And there's a reason for that. It is because she drives their ratings in an incredible way. And, you know, Janine Garofalo went through this, uh, her era, and the other day, I get an email, maybe it was just yesterday or last night, I get an email from somebody uh, at majorityreporters at gmail.com 
saying, uh, you know, like with Emma in the subject line. And it was something to the effect of like, I'm a long time listener, or maybe they didn't say that, but it, they had this feel. And like, I can't believe the way she reacted online to uh, the report about Rudy Giuliani getting COVID. And I was like, uh, I had just I had just had this conversation with Milo where I said, don't say in front of Saul, you hope he, <laughs> he dies. And I look at it and it was so Sam thought I thought I, well, I wasn't uh, sure. treated like, like I, I, hope I couldn't Giuliani. imagine I couldn't imagine what the tweet would be that would elicit this type of response from somebody who had our email, right? Like it's not like on Twitter, it's like, and I look at it and it was the most fair-minded and accurate tweet about Rudy Giuliani. Here it is. Uh and apparently you attracted the attention general. Why don't you read the tweet for everybody? So Emma? I said the last few months for Rudy Giuliani, right? So this actually more accurately would probably be the last seven weeks, but uh, it just broke uh, in the middle of Sunday by Trump himself that Rudy Giuliani has tested positive for coronavirus. So he gets caught allegedly undoing his pants in the Borat movie. That's number one, two, host an election fraud presser at Four Seasons Total Landscaping, sweat so much his hair dye melts, audibly farts in a hearing, which was confirmed by the Michigan state representative sitting next to him, I believe, and test positive for COVID-19. An icon, I say sarcastically, but also what a run, what a run. Jenna Ellis of Trump legal fame, I guess, even though I I think her credentials are uh, suspect, responds to me saying, imagine being such a worm that you'd actually tweet this, (laughs) just a depiction of what he did in the past few weeks the left's glee over the mayor's covid diagnosis is is evil and despicable so uh you are in the trump camp jenna ellis trump tweeted that obama should hug ebola patients back in 2011 when that was a deadly disease or that he should insinuating that obama should contract it so no leg to stand on there and you know is Rudy Giuliani, Rudy Giuliani's recent run quite funny. Yes. Did I really express glee about his COVID diagnosis in that tweet? No. <laughs> no, but- there is absolutely no glee in there. In fact, you, I mean, look, uh, the idea that he projection. is an icon or an avatar for uh, the Trump administration or, you know, 2020 or the last or, you know, the, the Republican regime, uh, I think is absolutely 100 percent accurate. Um I think if I think I, 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 I don't want to necessarily commend you for this, but it was completely a neutral, <laughs> neutral um, accounting of, of the, of, of Giuliani's exploits over the, um, the past uh, right. uh, seven weeks or so. You didn't even include that his, um, his top um, um, witness was apparently involved in some type of like, um, um, like uh, what, do, what do you call that? Revenge the, uh, porn, yeah, basically. Revenge porn. Um, he sends videos yeah. of her having sex with this man to his ex-wife. Um, he sneezed into a handkerchief and rubbed snot all over his face. Character limitations, unfortunately, prevented me from accurately depicting the run that Giuliani has been on, America's mayor, for the past several weeks of just being an absolute meme god for anybody who's online. I mean, he, he's objectively ridiculous and he's but like a, a gremlin come to life and they're pretending like I'm supposed to to weep and pretend Do like you this know isn't... Jenna Ellis. Sorry. Do you know her? Have you had any know interaction her. with no, her? No, just I mean the they must have viral. been trolling around looking for someone who they could say this um about and oh here is uh what is this is jenna ellis this is with funny, the- jenna ellis has been on a bit of a run herself here she's retweeting uh on november 22nd the trump campaign statement saying sydney paul is practicing law on her own she is not a member of the trump legal team but only three days earlier she was telling rudy and sydney paul to release the kraken so well and i'm interested a- like i uh, yeah, i'm just interested in like you know why they target emma for this because yeah. it, it has unleashed a slew of of bots i mean it's amazing it's i've never seen someone attacked the last time i saw someone attacked so virently by people with like 22 followers 
um, uh, they it was Mike uh, Cernovich going after me. They have a huge bot farm they that do. they attempt to, um, and this it is. But the the idea that they can maybe they wanted to shift the story about this. Obviously, you know, like doesn't she have like fourteen? Well, they cases wanted to, to play lose? victims. They wanted yes. to play victims as if the left was hoping that Rudy Giuliani dies. I didn't come close to saying that. I never said that. It is a fact that Rudy Giuliani has been extremely vocal and a huge part of this Trump orbit and has been embarrassing them publicly in ways that you couldn't make up on a regular basis, including his hair dye sweating off of his face and him farting. Like, I'm so sorry that I made fun of that. If one of those things happened with someone in the Biden and Obama orbit, what would the reaction be? Well, let's be clear. You're listing those things. And the words an icon. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think it's sarcastic, barely, but... well, I mean, it barely actually cuts across the idea. I mean, what would have been better if you didn't say an icon? If you I, just left it know. there and let other people uh, determine, you know, I don't know. I mean, but the idea that you were making fun of him in that tweet, I'm sorry, when you're, when the listing of actual facts about a person can be perceived as some type of like horrific attack cruel attack, then maybe that person should reevaluate the way they've been living their lives in such a way that maybe when it's in print, it starts to look pretty bad for them. Yeah. So I I did respond to her, though, which when I did more explicitly make fun of uh, him and I said, imagine simping for sweaty Rudy. You must love cousin marriage. Sad. (laughs) (laughs) But you know what? She she called me a worm like yeah, no, she Fine. left. The, she released the yeah, kraken, she wa- and you just released the kraken back she, at her. Right, right, right. She released the worm. She's been watching Jesus and Miro or something. Why is she saying worm? I don't know. It's a little weird. Um, but yeah, I got like a lot of messages. How do you look at yourself in the face in the morning? How do you look in the mirror if it doesn't crack under the weight of your own immorality? May God, lots of God people. What? Reaching yes. out to me, telling me God, God's going to curse me, or may God have mercy on my soul. You know, I don't understand the physics of a, of a mirror cracking on the weight of your own immorality. I don't know. I think it's. Uh, I I think I would probably have to step on it for that to happen. But maybe you know, God doesn't oh. apply. God's physics don't. Um, that would be actually by. pretty funny if you were the type of person who just like put all your mirrors on the floor. <laughs> sure. Um, but it, by the way, though, I, I understand I'm this. None of this bothered me at all because they are such clowns. But it just it's a taste of how much worse people, women of color specifically get this. I mean, women in general, but women of color like the vitriol directed at Ilhan Omar and Ocasio-Cortez, but specifically Ilhan Omar. I mean, this is a fraction of what these women have to face on a daily basis. And it's relentless. And it it. It's just, um, it's unbelievable. There is no doubt that like um, you can pick out um, that, that, that the right likes to isolate and choose specifically women who, you know, and with all due respect uh, to you, Emma, um, the, you know, it would be equally bizarre in my mind if I had written something like that and I became the object of like, this is what we're going to leverage off of. Like, yeah. Like, honestly, like you can't find anybody else like they're they're going in and they're they're targeting. They're targeting women uh, in this instance as their pivot point, because they know that Giuliani's fans, and if they want to try and make this about, um, you know, feeling bad for Rudy and the d- disgustingness of the of the left, they need to target a woman to really uh, get some mileage out of it. That's where it that's where it, it, it begins to like. Because that's just the nature of their business. Tried and true. I mean, that's they, what it is. They do it with Ocasio Cortez. She's their cash co- cow for this very, um, very strategy. It's been effective for them. It drums up latent sexism or explicit sexism within their base, and then of course racism brought into those yep. other issues. So it's just you know, it it, it would be annoying, but it it really was just was amusing me yesterday. Well, I hope it. I hope it got you some new followers. Um, me too. Uh, so let's talk about, um, the, uh, Trump rally in Georgia, ostensibly to support Kelly Leffler and, um, and David Perdue in their race, in their runoff on January 5th. Um, 
you got to wonder like if they walked off stage and said, well, it could have been worse. I mean, because they were terrified, right? Like they, he could they have not know, mentioned like, us how, at all. How but much he talked yeah. about us for 30 seconds. That was something. Here is, uh, here is them uh, when Leffler and Purdue joined Trump on stage. Listen to the just the overwhelming excitement about these two on stage. We need you to vote January 5th. If you're our voice on January 5th, we'll be your voice for years. We have to make sure that we keep America strong. <laughs> Thank you. Well, you know what? My colleague, David Perdue, my good friend, wants to make sure that you vote. We are going to vote because if we don't vote, we will lose the country. If we vote, we will win. Hey, guys, I want to take liberty just one second. I want to say something personal to President Trump. Hey, guys, I want to say something for President Trump personally. Guys. I want to say something personal for President Trump. God bless you. We love you, Mr. President. We love the First Lady. And we're going to fight and win those two seats and make sure you get a fair, square deal in the state of Georgia. God bless you, Mr. President. That'll do. Oh, my God. They were up there for that. Well, thank you very much. That was it. Wow. So wow. they're screaming or well, chanting we fight for Trump. That. How, how, that's unbelievable. You see how much he was laughing? Fight for Trump. Fight for Trump. He is fight so psyched. He fight is loving this. Yeah. Fight Did you see Trump. the smile on his face when Purdue was trying to talk to him mm-hmm. and all it was just fight for Trump was was drowning out? Like Purdue's like, please, I'm gonna say something nice to the president. Please. Please, and- I love Melania. I love you. I love her in a platonic way. Please just give me more support. Channel that this was- just spend 30 more seconds on trying to encourage people to come out to vote. Just Did a you little see at one point longer. two where he where they started in that chant at the end of what Leffler was saying? And he starts doing this like he catches himself yeah because he's doing the like yes fight for trump fight for trump with his fist and then he realizes like oh wait a second i'm I'm supposed to pretend like i'm and you know i mean just just to make it clear any other politician in the world in that situation who is sent there ostensibly to help them going like would would hold up their hands and say they are fighting for me. These two are exactly right. who we need to have. <laughs> like, I'm just giving an example of like what a normal human being who, I mean, I don't consider necessarily politicians and normal human beings. Like, you know, maybe, you know, but even a in normal that context, politician, a normal, yes. yes would somebody... you simply say, you know, hey, take it easy guys. I appreciate the support, but these guys are the guys who are fighting for me, you know, cause that's uh, ostensibly why you're there. Yeah, I mean, well, he, there's a way to bask in that too if you do it correctly, but Trump can't even go there. No. Yeah, well, that would get in the way of him being the main story. I mean, this is one step away from what he did to Martha McSally, which still is one of my favorite Trump 2020 moments when he <laughs> fa- when he said, "Come on, Martha, nobody wants to hear from you, Martha. They really only want to hear from me. Hurry up, hurry up, Martha." I mean, the unmanning obviously she's a woman but figuratively um of these of these senators it's amazing and so all they can do as the crowd is yelling at them to fight for trump and um overturn the democratically elected president joe biden is praise his family like how small how small does that make you feel it's pathetic pathetic they're awesome. they're at the the whims of this idiot, this man child, this complete narcissist, and they just have to suck it up and take it. I mean, yep. it's debasing. Uh, and and hopefully it is um, more importantly. I mean, I I enjoy watching uh, Republican senators get uh, humiliated, but more importantly, hopefully it is um, demoralizing right. for their voters. Hopefully it um, it suppresses, you know, and this is frankly, <clears throat> on some level, like this is um, this is the work that Democrats should have had to do, um, you know, should have actively pursued 
over the past two years, which is to sort of like force these, you know, force those people who don't want to be close to Trump, be close to Trump and throw uh, lob grenades in, um, not literally, but, you know, draw, uh, drop uh, political grenades in between where people are hugging uh, Trump closely. I mean, this is the way, um, because you can see that at one point, like it's the opportunity for it to go sideways is really intense. We saw it with McSally. Um, let's play, um, <laughs> uh, let's go to uh, the IM for a moment. Uh, Emma's list of facts about Rudy uh, really hurt the right's feelings. Emma the Worm Vigland is a worthy and appropriate successor to Dennis the Worm Rodman. Uh, <laughs> uh, I didn't know where you were going with that, but, that's but yeah, Sam's I mean, sweater daddy. Um, here's uh, Band Don Gino quote, maybe once Emma takes down the mob, she'll have earned the right to say who can fart in court. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. <sighs> I know. I don't have the, the cloud. I'm not America's mayor, so. You got to take down the mob before you can say who's uh, who has the right to fart. I mean, that's... Um, here is... Let's play a clip of uh, that Kelly Leffler. She, um, she debated um, uh, Raphael Warnock uh, last night, I think it was, Sunday night? Sunday night, last night, uh, in uh, Georgia. And um, she... You know, she she basically I, I don't know, I saw a clip of of her um, saying uh, the radical liberal Raphael Warnock over and over and over again. And this is you know, this is what they're trying to do. It's unclear. Again, I, you know, there's not a lot of data about like these type of runoff elections in terms of like debates and how that's going to influence it. It's very hard to assess because you're not quite clear on who you're talking to. Uh, because it's not a general election. You're not going to have high turnout. And you wonder, you know, how many of those non-high turnout people are going to watch a debate anyways. But And the polling uh, between Leffler and Purdue is so different based on, um, you know, how Georgians feel about both. I mean, Purdue has a way better chance than Leffler. And so I don't it's know. very I mean, hard to gauge. I don't know from the polling that he has a way better chance, but he has uh, he he's, he is, you know, um, doing better than Leffler. He did better in the initial election. And part of it was because Leffler was appointed. A, she's never been elected. B, she ran against a Trumper uh, in Doug Collins. And so it's hard and C, to see. She has the charisma of a blank sheet of paper which is kind of what we see here <laughs> let's uh, watch this clip um what's also interesting she also has some uh, some of her own day trading uh, problems as it were it's a uh, uh, being a little bit uh, facetious but she does have some trading issues she also apparently oversees um, a uh, committee that uh, where uh, they um oversee some of what her her husband does who i think is like the the chair of the um well, which uh, stock exchange? New York Stock Exchange. New she York is stock the, exchange. They have a $300 million uh, net worth or something like that. And she uses her private plane to fly the campaign events. So lady of the people. There we go. And here she is um, uh, during this debate. Question. Senator, should members of Congress be barred from trading stocks? Look, what's at stake here in this election is the American dream. That's what's under attack. When they attack me for a lie, a left-wing media lie conspired with the Democrats by, this is an attack on every single Georgian who gets up every day to work hard to provide a better life for their family who wants to live the American dream. Uh, a reminder, the question was, should senators be allowed to make stock trades? Wow. And now, of course, how many Georgians sitting around their kitchen table going... Sweetheart, if, uh, if our senator is not allowed to make use of the inside information they're going to get to trade stocks, I, I, I don't know how we're going to put uh, food on our table. Yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, she can't answer that question because that would defeat the whole purpose of her candidacy. She's there to enrich herself and her husband. And so they can get their second private jet to fly around the country to. I, I did wonder, you know, I wondered out loud, how is she able to be married to the guy who's the head of the New York Stock Exchange if they live in Georgia? Do they actually live in Georgia? 
the answer is, oh, they fly on the private jet back and forth so they can see their uh, their spouses. That's the kind of down home Georgian that she's trying to portray herself as. There you go. Um, and by the way, she infamously was in trouble for. I think eventually it was uh, the charges were scuttled away, but she was being investigated for insider trading and using the information that she received in coronavirus briefings to sell certain stock and made millions off of it by many calculations. So if that isn't the number one, that's her home. I believe from what I've read, that was the, uh, the priciest home bought in the Atlanta area ever in tuxedo park, the priciest yeah. home in tuxedo park. Wow. I'm going to, uh, I mean, it was on her wow. Wikipedia page, which I, which I skimmed the other day. That's Let me just home? say, yeah. Damn. Look at that pool. <laughs> First off, like what, I, this is what I don't understand. Why do people who have that kind of money, I'm sorry, but I look at that house to put that back up there. It I was the most expensive is- residential real estate transaction ever recorded in Atlanta. A ten point five million dollar, fifteen thousand square foot home. I'm sorry, but is that is that Desconte. house? Is it me or is that house just not? I don't find that house. To, I mean, that's it seems well. That's because you're odd. a coastal elite, Sam. You you spit on you know people, normal billionaires. Yeah, normal billionaires South. like to that like to yeah do vague approximations of French architecture. <laughs> I was gonna say that looks right. like that looks like. Um, the, the, the guy who planned Versailles, um, you know, like cousin who just didn't make it. Yeah. It's like, yeah. Gianni Versace's, um, kind of un untalented niece went into Although, agriculture or architecture. And this is what she came up with. Is that a forever pool? What is that? An infinity that's like where pool. You, infinity, oh, pool. infinity pool, infinity pool. Like infinity. that's where you, you go up to the side and then you yeah, can't yeah. see the side of it. That, that That's pretty sweet. I just wonder what they're looking at though on the other side. Um, just a well, pile of cash. Folks, by all means, uh, become a member of the show. Uh, Cause I, <laughs> my new goal. Because Sam wants a forever pool. I want that uh, infinity pool no. uh, right there. Um Oh, uh, folks, um, here is, this is an attempt by Fox and Friends. This is going to be the talking point. Um, There's going to be two talking points if we do see any type of student loan relief. And and let's be clear. Um, If Joe Biden sticks with, and I don't think he will, but let's just presume if he sticks with his sort of limited means tested $10,000 one for, you know, uh, is it, is it, I can't remember if it's private or, or public loan. I mean, if he sticks with sort of doing one of these sort of small bore answers on this, people should understand the political blowback is going to be exactly the same. The political blowback is going to be exactly the same. It is quite clear that when you look at the enormous amount of money that um, we have in student loans, the enormous amount of that, which is interest, not principal, the cost uh, to our government is going to be relatively minimal for the enormous benefit that it's going to bring to our government and to our society at large uh, because of the much needed stimulus that we need. We, We have known for years already that student loan debt has been the number one inhibition for like new housing starts, uh, for all sorts of, you know, and also, you know, put aside the economy just for the ability of people to have the freedom to choose following, uh, you know, engaging in professions or, or uh, jobs that they're interested in, as opposed to ones that they feel um, they need to to pay off their loans. Um, but we're going to see these arguments deployed. Here is one of them that we're going to see from the right, which is sort of a hilarious. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that the all the uh, data is in on this. The people who tend to own loans or hold loans um, are people with less money to begin with. Otherwise, they would have paid for their college. Uh, here, here is uh, clip number 11. Do you agree with that? So they, they'll, the kids will spend more money but because their debt's paid for? The, the, the jig is up, okay? This is, this is the real deal, what's going on here. First, let's look at the facts. 
56% of outstanding college debt is held by folks with professional degrees. Uh, this debt, 20%, master's degrees at 36%, by the way, up from just 27% a few years ago. These are the highest earners in America. They make more money than anyone else. 44% of people living uh, on, under the median income are people with high school degrees or less. You're, you're talking about bailing out, for the most part, rich, white, woke folks who, by the way, were promised amazing things for getting a college degree. And since they don't, this is the way you make sure you can appease them so that maybe they don't start looking at a populist ex uh, regime. Maybe they don't get so turned off by the promise that if I can get a master's degree, I'm on my way. So this is what you're doing. And you do it under the guise of helping the working person. You do it under the guise of helping blacks and Hispanics. They're selling this on the pain and suffering of other people. But the reality is, is that this is income redistribution for the rich people in this country. That's the ironic part about this. It's, it's, it's people need to delve into the numbers and really see what's going on here. Not the sales pitch, which is a lie, but what really is going on here. Yeah, the richest people in the country have student loan debt. Well, the it doesn't the, pass the smell test and they have him on so he can say, oh, they say it's for black and Latinos. I'm black. I'm black. But uh, it's actually not. It's to help white people. Uh, I don't believe the Democrats, that Let's they're actually trying start to help people with, of color. He, he contradicts himself in this, which is they were promised something if they got master's degrees and graduate and, and college degrees. Uh, and when it didn't show up, um, they, um, they when it didn't show up, then they're mad and this is the way to placate them. Well, it's, it's either one thing or another. Either they're making, either they have been able to monetize these degrees or they haven't. Um, now, it is true that master's degrees have a dollar amount that is significantly larger than undergraduate, which is obvious because you've gone to school for longer. Um, but in terms of actual people, um, numbers of people, it's not the case. Um, it's also quite clear that, um, that Black folk suffer more in terms of uh, the, the weight and the cost of, of college loans, um, basically because they, uh, we have wealth disparity and income disparity uh, between races to begin with. And so they're more, uh, they're more likely to need uh, these loans. But I, I, it is fascinating to me that, um, uh, that it is um, that they, that they are going to attempt this angle for this, but it is going to be one of of many, and they'll bring you know that guy out to just argue that one. Yeah, and then of course they'll bring out the well, you had to pay for your college, geriatric audience. <laughs> I, I say that facetiously, but older audience and even middle aged people, you had to pay for your college, so. Why should these uh, entitled millennials and their avocado toast have to get their loans forgiven? You were able to climb your way to the top because you are so exceptional. It's amazing how much of their arguments um, that that try to stomp on any progressive progress rely on making older conservatives feel like uh, the younger generation is stealing some Indeed. something from them. Here's let me just read the executive summary, just the first half of the executive summary of a Brookings uh, research. This is from 2016. And so the dynamic has only gotten worse here. Um, the moment they earn their bachelor's degrees, black college graduates owe seventy four hundred dollars more on average than their white peers. Twenty three thousand versus sixteen thousand, including non borrowers and the averages. But over the next few years, because we have income disparity the black-white debt gap more than triples to a whopping $25,000. Differences in interest accrual and graduate school borrowing lead to black graduates holding nearly $53,000 in student le uh, loan debt four years after graduation, almost twice as much as their white counterparts. And we know because of the exponential quality of this interest that th that disparity is probably more five years out. 10 years out. So um, this is, you know, but the, people should be ready for this because this is going to be one of the arguments that is deployed 
Um, and then of course it's like, it's unfair to me. Cause I, I did everything right. I paid off my loans. Well, if you did, then you, you are not, um, then you are uh, doing well and do not need uh, to have your loans forgiven. I mean, yeah. it's like the functional equivalent of like, Hey, um, I don't know. Why are my taxes higher? I, I did everything right. And I'm paying, um, uh, higher taxes. Well, that's because you're in an income bracket that's higher than other people. And we have progressive taxation in this country. Well, they don't believe in progressive taxation. A well, lot of times they believe in a flat tax and everyone in who they know, everyone who they surround themselves with, they can afford college for their kids. They don't have to worry about it. They don't have to worry about their kids leaving school and whatever uh, degree they get, having to to be crippled with an average of $30,000 uh, in 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 debt. I mean, that's the average in this country. Is Fox News trying to say there that the average college student that leaves school is not talented enough and on their merits haven't re- uh, received the benefits of their degree because they just are not exceptional enough? I mean, that kind of is their argument, and they're they're banking on the ignorance of how widespread student loan debt is. Um, with their audience. Um, oh, let's play this clip too. I want to, um, this, uh, this is an old clip, but I just saw it for the first time last week. I thought it was really good, particularly, you know, it's already, we're already starting to see this die down. And as we get more data in, it is becoming clear and clearer that the, um, the, the Democrats were not inhibited by the idea of uh, defund the police. I mean, you know, people can have their opinions as to whether that's the best marketing slogan or not. Um, But the fact remains that we have at least five cities across the country uh, where we're actually seeing, and and more so probably with smaller cities, but five five major cities, you know, New York, LA, San Francisco, um, where we're seeing real, at least, um, attempts at change in, in terms of the budget, you know, not as much as we would want in terms of, uh, cuts to the police budget in New York, but we're seeing pilot programs in all these cities to empower, uh, EMT, you know, EMT people, uh, to respond to, um, folks who are having mental health issues as opposed to police, um, we can go on down the line with this in terms of like um, attempted, uh, you know, uh, I don't know. I, I think we should be doing it for traffic stops too, frankly. Uh, but we can go on down the line. But the, but there has been movement. Um, seen polling from uh, Minneapolis and uh, people are looking for um, funds taken away from police uh, and invested in other um social services in the city to diminish uh, the, the portfolio, essentially, that police have. But here is a great um, um, testimony, if I guess you will. This is at a, uh, appears to be a, like a city meeting. Um, it is Yusuf Abdul Qadir. He's the director of the local chapter of the NY uh, New York Civil Liberties Union in Syracuse. And he's basically uh, making the argument to the mayor there, Ben Walsh. This is over the summer in July. And this is uh, as, as, as well put as, uh, as anything I've seen on this uh, topic. Um, how, what percent of the police live in the city? Uh, what, about 5% or so? 5%, so 95% don't live in the city. Yes, so sir. when you say that the vast majority of the percentage goes towards salaries, et cetera, yes, fringe benefits, that means that they take their money on 81, go to outside the city, pay taxes in those communities that have some of the best schools while we have an underfunded school district. $60 million up. So I just want to put into context what we're talking about, because it's really easy to say, Mayor, and with all due respect, I like you. But that was a very politician answer. What, I'm it's, sorry, what specifically? The, the, we will consider and we will look. What, I'm, what, I'm, what we're saying is we're not interested in considering and looking. What we're saying is actually there's 50 million commit to 20 million cut. Right. Because we're sending money as the mayor of Syracuse. When you don't have a tax base, you're sending money out of Syracuse. And not just for 30 years, for the rest of their life. Because their pensions, their health insurance, their families. So we are funding for other people's communities to have the promise of the American dream 
while we are denying it in our community. That's the context that you as the mayor have to look at this under. So when we talk about renegotiating union contract, what we're saying is you can't play around with maybe um, we will, no, y'all gotta go because you don't provide a service that is beneficial to the community, that is meaningful to the community. The services that you provide criminalize our community, impoverish our community, reallocate resources to suburbs. We are actually funding the suburbs, both in our police departments and in our schools. And to be clear, just to be clear, it's not just the fact of like the percentage of people, we're also funding what race of people on the police force. The percentage of race of teachers as well, superintendent, board president. So we want to put in context because it's not just a class issue, it's a race issue. We are telling black and brown people and poor people, you don't matter. The, de the devil's in the data and in the details. Mayor, respectfully, it is not acceptable for us to be here considering. So there it is. Um, I mean, that is uh, put as, you know, uh, succinctly as you would want in terms right. of, you know, the city's got to decide how to allocate its resources. And it is allocating its resources um, to essentially like uh, a, a an air tunnel that is sucking more resources out of the city. And in terms of the services that it's providing for the city, it's criminalizing a huge percentage of the population and denying them um, the other type of, of support that they, they need in the city. I mean, that's basically it. It's right. Just and as we, I mean, I'm not sure specifically about Syracuse, but as um, our schools are funded with property taxes too. So it's, it's, it's a doubly, uh, it's a compounding yes. issue there because not, so you're criminalizing people in the city of Syracuse and you're, providing them with inadequate education funding. And when there is funding in the city, it goes to the cops, then it goes to their pension funds and they live outside the city. So it's tripling down on resources that are exiting where they're needed. Right. I mean, because you, you increase the property values of uh, yep. the suburbs, uh, you decrease the property values uh, in the city that those property values in the city are what fund your uh, teachers. It's basically just a um, whatever a the robbery. opposite of virtuous, an invirtuous, disvirtuous uh, circle. Yep. So uh, there you go. Um, all right. A couple more. I will take one more phone call. Bear with me, folks. I'm sorry. We don't. Uh, a lot of people have been hanging on uh, the phone for 88 minutes. Calling from a 781 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hi, Sam. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Oh, oh hi. Uh, my name's Charlie. Uh, I'm from Indiana. Uh, Long-time listener of the show. Big fan. Um, I actually, I mean, I've had this question for a little while ago, uh, and it's not necessarily pertaining to uh, current events at the moment, but I uh, still would like to hear your thoughts. Uh, so I work uh, in machine learning and numerical optimization, um, and one thing that's kind of bummed me out is I feel like I really hate the jobs that are out there. I really don't feel like anything is really worthwhile. Um, and one thing I want to ask you, in fact, I'd like to ask like all the progressive pundits, on do you think there are any good opportunities for using like machine learning to help progressive movements? Uh, or like, you know, uh, analyzing certain data sets that could maybe help people organize. Uh, I don't know. I just, you know, more general questions, just get your thoughts on it. I, I mean, to be honest with you, I haven't given much thought to that. Um, but I would imagine there are organizations out there that, um, I, I mean, I, I, there, there may be from a, like an organiz, organizing perspective, um, you know, I suppose you figure out an algorithm for us to, uh, you know, get more of, uh, those, what was it Michael from, uh, from, uh, Brooklyn, um, you know, to get into people's, uh, uh, feeds. But I also would imagine that there's opportunities from, you know, an organizing standpoint or figuring out, like, I don't know, um, 
how you get people mobilized in various contexts? I, I mean, that's a good question, but I'm not even sure to be honest with you. Like I understand enough of the, the, the abilities that exist with stuff like machine learning and um, scanning things like public records would be interesting. I mean, like in terms of like campaign contributions, I'm sure there's websites that do that, but I know that um, I have a buddy in Texas and he had to do a lot of that on his own. So if there was something like that, um, that that's a, that, those sorts of disclosures, uh, a way to aggregate that data seems like the first place I would look. Interesting. So like optical character recognition and stuff like that. Or even, yeah, like automated, like, because it's all on these different forms, these disclosure forms, and you kind of have to look at them independently. So if you could teach a machine to, you know, pull that data and put it into spreadsheets automatically, that would be, I think, probably helpful. I see. I mean, you know, you were talking about trying to find people that are better suited, like more primed for, you know, taking in like left ideas. Uh, the tricky part of that is that, you know, that's data that, it's very difficult to aggregate and the best people who have it probably aren't really interested in promoting left ideas. Right. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. That's a good question. Send, send me an email at majority reporters at gmail.com and I will, um, I'll talk to some people. Um, if, if that's something that you're actually like interested in, 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 in doing, like I, I, I imagine, you know, this has always been my, my problem to be honest with you. Like, you know, we have all this data about who watches our YouTube show, right? That, 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 yeah. that YouTube provides us. And um, we've taken surveys in the past and I look at it and I'm like, oh, this seems interesting. And I suppose there's something that could be done with this. And I just don't have the training or the background or maybe the disposition to sort of like even imagine what you can do from this. Like that's, that's the thing that I've, and so in, the, in this area, I am, I am, um, I am not terribly, well suited to give you a good response, but I know people who, you know, sort of work in these areas and I could ask them like if AI could yeah, do anything be, for you. That would be phenomenal. Um, yeah. I, um, yeah, I'll definitely follow up with a follow up email. Okay, and, great. Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't want to take up any more time. Thank you so much for having me on. This is uh, like an adrenaline rush actually making it through. Oh, well, I appreciate, uh, appreciate the call. Interesting. Interesting to think about. Thank you. Um, Have a great day. You too. Um, it, it, it's this is like one of those things. Like where I don't know if you guys remember Aaron Schwartz, but it's sort of like this is one of those things where, um, like you wonder like what a guy like that would be doing today in terms of being able to sort of. I don't know. Yeah, um, totally. Uh, uh, people should check out, I think it was The Boy Who Could Change the World, uh, the book on him. But yeah, just amazing uh, guy. He um, he came into the office very, very early on. And I was like... The old office or the one? The in old the... office, the old office. And... Um, who did Aaron, in... Sh Aaron Schwartz? Yeah. Oh, wow. I didn't he, know that. He uh, he came into the office with uh, with Ben Wickler, and I met with him a couple of times early when we launched the show. And I think maybe Dorsey would remember this because I think he, Dorsey was there. I'm not quite sure. And um, I had said like, um, you know, at the time I w I can't remember exactly. I thought like maybe we would need to do a clock because we were thinking about you know uh, this is ten years ago, and I thought you know it's only a matter of time before we're we're doing radio with this and what i really need is a clock that is on the web that will count down or something like that i can't remember exactly what what the specifics were <laughs> and he sat down at i don't know if he had his computer out or he just sat on one of our computers and i'm talking to ben i just like catching up on something and like within five minutes he was just like all right did it i'm like oh, what do you mean you did it did what and he had coded one and just built it and it was just sort of it's like a party trick i mean that was just like nothing you know like that's uh but i was just like whoa beyond my comprehension yeah how someone yeah i i'm usually skeptical of the word genius but i mean you read about oh gosh everything he did yeah no in the he, short time brilliant guy a really horrible tragic uh story and you know i don't i haven't followed up on what that prosecutor is doing these days but that was 
just a perfect example of like a sort of, um, uh, 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 I don't know, half a dozen things that are just absolutely back ass uh, nuts in this country. Um, all right, let, let me uh, take some IMs here. Uh, the living, uh, the family living under uh, Tim Pool's hat. Word on the street has it that Tim Pool is working on a new roundtable show with all of your least favorite grifters. It's called Game of Circle Jerks. All right. Underpaid elevator operator. You guys absolutely have to watch the trailer for the free lunch express. You brought it up last week, but never got to it. Well, yeah, we should play that tomorrow. Uh, Germ, Germ McLean. There's no telling how long snotty Rudy has been infected and considering his hygiene, he's infected loads. Can uh, you get COVID from a fart? That was the second D. <laughs> it's COVID. Oh. This one from snotty Rudy's farts. I mean, you... It's not inconceivable. I don't think they were in a small enough location and he may not have generated, although that's the only one we heard. Right? I mean, it's not like my understanding is these things yeah, come he probably he probably got a better handle on the subsequent ones. I know there's a genuine concern. First of all, they the one of the things that they use to predict uh in um cohabitating places like dorms is they will test uh, the sewage because it is in uh, fecal matter. And so um, it's not inconceivable. Lucas, both bike fuel and majority blend are medium roast. Personally, I prefer light. So natural Sigma or Humdinger are my current go-to choices. Uh, just coffee and Credo Mobile, the two longest lasting effects on my life, being a majority report, a break room live viewer since Air America. Excellent. But, 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 did you enjoy being a teenager in the 50s? Must have been a cool time to grow up. I was not a teenager in the 50s. I was not even a TJ, teenager in the 60s. Prove it. Uh, <laughs> um, folks, we're out of time. Uh, I, um, I was not, I, I mean, I, I, I could prove it. I mean, it's, I think... Uh, I keep changing my, long my birthday on, uh, on Wikipedia. Yeah, yeah. I keep changing my birthday We're, on Wikipedia. Sam stuff. was born in Kenya. Uh, Pono, Minnesota uh, GOP has completely embraced Mike Lindell and Trumpism. Jennifer Carnahan, Minnesota GOP, is contesting DFL victories and organizing Republicans to uplift these conspiracies in the state. There were armed uh, people who were uh, protesting. On, it was the Secretary of State's office in, uh, in Michigan. Uh, all right, let's take a couple of these M's and we'll be out of here. Speth, this is a fantastic caller. Can you guys please clip for sharing? He articulated the driving force behind the right perfectly. I think that was the um, caller yeah, creating it. fear. Uh, Thames Dar Darwin, Sam, you let it slip that you've been watching Marvel Cinematic Universe films with Saul. I cannot express to you how desperately I have been trying to get him to watch Batman. But he's like, no, first... We we had, we watched all the Captain America. The Captain America films were actually not bad. They're the last pretty one good. Was not great, They're pretty good. But the Winter good. Soldier, I thought, was pretty good. Yeah, the first they, one was pretty. They good. have things to say about like, you know, va vaguely. Uh, m movies in Hollywood tend to be so pro military because they have this symbiotic relationship with the military, so they can use their equipment and stuff like that. But I feel like the Marvel movies kind of transcend that a little bit more because they are so high budget and so have studio backing. So I feel like winter, was it winter soldier? That's kind of critical of us intervention or maybe not. I mean, yeah, I, I, I you know, I, don't I mean, know. I, like, I'm what just can you expect? For, I was just for looking friend. for like a story. Like I watched the, the, the Avengers, the, the, the full, the last couple. And it's like, there's no story there. There's like it's like I don't like the adventure. I like the standalone ones. Like I like Black Panther. I like Wonder Woman. I Black like Panther. The, I liked w I Wonder like, Woman is not. Uh, <laughs> I know it's yeah. DC. I'm so it's sorry. DC. I'm so sorry. Uh, Black Panther. I thought was great. Um, a couple of these at Captain America, but he's like, we're gonna watch uh, Iron Man. And I think like Iron Man one was like tolerable, but then he's like talking Thor, and I'm like, dude. I said to him, I said straight out, I said, dude, there is no way I'm watching Thor. Like this whole thing, like the whole thing, like where they got, 
extraterrestrial, you know, buttons. And every time it's like, there's a portal that opens and all these people come in and they fight them and blah, blah, blah. You know, it's like, I did like the uh, civil war one. The only thing that was good about that was like, Hey, you guys go around as like, you just decided you're going to protect everybody, but look at the destruction. <laughs> that is in your yeah. Week. I like that. Cause yeah, they, they, they've, I forget. But then of course they, they ultimately together. say like, Oh no, we shouldn't be under anybody's auspices. You can trust us because we get superpowers. Jerks. Speaking of that, uh, people should watch the Boys uh, series. I think it's on Amazon Prime. Um, yeah, I, I heard good things. It is. It is very excellent, and it's it's basically a satire of all those like all the superheroes work for a corporation. The Boys. Okay. Um, uh, I think you can expect a call soon from your good buddy, Tim Poole, asking whether you understand now what he was talking about when you compared your utilitarianism to Thanos. Don't say you weren't warned. I'm not watching that last one with Thanos. He's just like in the deep background in those first two. And I just, it's, it just seems like I'm just looking at this. And I'm going like, Saul, are you really enjoying this? Like, I mean, it does, it's complete jibber jabber. What I don't understand is like all of the fights, there's no proportionality. I don't know which punch is going to be the punch that that actually knocks them out. I don't know who's stronger than whom. I don't know what power means what. Like I, I mean, find it, it, it's you're exactly right. It's just like it's like just mush. And also mostly, I mean, except for the last one, which they, you know, Robert Downey Jr. wanted to be done with it. Spoiler alert, like they all survive and they're all good. Yep. The only thing, the only good thing I can say about those movies. Jim Carrey's not in it. I, oh Saul, man, I could not agree with you more. Oh man, Saul was like went through a huge Jim Carrey's the best stage. Yeah, we've all been there, but like, no. I now he's there. trying to reemerge as Biden, and it's horrible. Oh. I mean, I love the rest of SNL. Really? And for no, I, I was saying it for. Oh, well, you for you're being sarcastic. Jugger I was covering my bases. <laughs> juggernaut magnum scrutinizing cabinet choices wouldn't it be more appropriate to compare what if joe biden was coming into office in march 2020 as the pandemic was breaking circumstances are awful but what what we should acknowledge the differences as well with obama's well oh 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 i see what you're saying that well i'm not convinced that I, I don't know if that analogy is quite accurate, to be honest with you. Uh, Obama, you know, had the, you know, had a couple of months of seeing this uh, play out, the financial, uh, the financial implosion. Uh, by October, we knew who, who uh, we, this was all quite clear what was happening. Wildcard 2-6, ask the average Trump supporter the difference between illegal entry and seeking asylum, and they have no effing clue. And it's all thanks to MR crew dunking on some a-hole about a year back. I stump these asses all the time with that. In fact, I'm asked that uh, of this one guy I know two years ago. He still has no clue. Proving once and for all the right is a bunch of lemming-minded ass bitches. Said it. Meant it. Six deployments, Marine infantry, back it up. So WTF, what are you going to do about it, Trumper? All right, take it easy. Take it easy. Okay. Um, appreciate the call. Uh, Unix Joker. Sam successfully deprogramming right wingers who stumble on his channel by getting them hooked on Sunset Lake CBD and chilling them out. Comrade Cat. Been trying to get my 60 year old dad to watch the MR. He was a union guy. Voted for Obama twice and Hillary in 2016. Then he found QAnon on the internet. Is a complete believer in the whole conspiracy. I hope if he listens to MR, he can be set free like that call from BK. Bernie's sandwiches. I'm sorry about that. I was uh, I was where this caller was politically in 2011 when I started listening to your show. Within weeks, I was an Obama bot. And by the election, I was already questioning him from the left. For some of us, having all those videos to binge was a huge, it was huge in waking me up. All right, two more. The big caker. Sam, you got to start SEO marketing and target IDW watchers on YouTube and Google. I would love to. I don't know how to do that. And the final I am of the day. Cointel Pro, the new episode of You're Wrong About goes how into people are subscribable, susceptible to misinformation. Apparently, anxiety increases openness to new ideas, which is consistent with the explosion of QAnon. Interesting. All right, Emma, Brendan, Matt, good job today. See you guys tomorrow. 
It might take all the strength I got to get to where I want, but I know somehow I'm gonna get there. I wasn't looking when I just got caught between the truth and the lies. 